This is a marathon, by all means. I don't, I don't know, perhaps your, your lectures here are very long, usually, so you are used to this, but uh, uh, we usually have uh, shorter lectures, I would say, uh, or let's say not uh, compacted into one week, in this case, three days, right? So hopefully you'll, you'll stay out until the end. So the end should be even more interesting than the beginning, I have to say. Uh, but, you know, we have to build up a bit momentum. So this is why I will start with, uh, uh, you know, uh, more fundament fundamental things. And then I will go all the way up to things that may, uh, you know, interest you a bit more. Uh, in particular, I will try to, see, uh, to show you how uh, theoretical results done in uh, database theory in uh, theoretical computer science right, that, that uh, are about uh, complexities, um, could apply to machine learning, right? And I will try to explain a little bit on this uh, in the third part, okay? So hopefully, I, 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 with this, this can motivate you enough to stay until the end, right? Uh, which is uh, Saturday. Okay, so let me know when, when I can start. Yeah? Yeah, I can start, okay. So welcome, uh, everybody. So my name is Dan Tanu, and I'm going to give you a crash course on uh, uh, joints, on aggregates, and on optimization. First, I will start with joints, then I will build on top of them um, uh, for so-called functional aggregate queries that uh, are aggregates on top of joints, and then I will show how optimization problems can benefit from this uh, uh, work on uh, uh, joints and aggregates. Uh, before uh, I actually uh, uh, go ahead uh, with the technical uh, content, I would like to really acknowledge uh, a large amount of people who helped me or you know, gave me slides, uh, they helped me uh, build some of the examples uh, and uh, proffered uh, these uh, this slides. Uh, so they are useful and they hopefully are uh, without errors. So in particular, uh, people in my group uh, uh, Zavodny, Schleich, Kara, Nikolic, uh, Zhang, uh, Chukanu, then uh, collaborators from Relational AI, as Shimon mentioned. Uh, uh, this work uh, stems from some of the people uh, who used to work at uh, Logic Blocks, now at, uh, they are at Relational AI, and uh, we are collaborating intensively on aspects of this work, so I'm going to talk here. And uh, they are, um, yeah, so let me press here. Ah, you. Abo Kamis and Go and Nguyen is a professor in statistics at Michigan. Uh, and, uh, and let's go. So the goal of the course is to give an introduction to a principal approach to in database computation. What do I mean by this? I mean that we have very large amounts of data and uh, we want to efficiently do computation over this data. And we like to leverage as much as possible techniques developed by the database theorists or by uh, uh, theoretical computer scientists and people in algorithms, right? And uh, I called it in database uh, for this reason, because we would like to use, uh, in a way, uh, techniques developed mostly to deal with very large data sets. And I will start uh, by uh, uh, basically uh, uh, exp giving you some background on joints in particular here, the focus will be on structural properties, right? If you look at the results of joints, you realize that they actually follow certain patterns. The data, the, the result of a join is very sparse, and we could take advantage of the sparsity, right, for more efficient processing. And that is actually a very important aspect, and I think is fundamental, and this is why it requires a bit of work uh, on our side. It, will, it is not complicated at all, you'll see, we can go through it very, very easily. And um, joints are, in fact, the basic building block. You know, if you, if you have several data sources and you want to bring them together, the means of bringing them together is uh, by, by joints, right? And uh, uh, I mentioned about the sparsity, and I will actually discuss, in particular, uh, how to systematically get rid of redundancy in the representation of the joint results, yeah? And, uh, and for this, I would introduce a so-called uh, notion of factorized data, yeah? And you will see how, how much benefit you can get by, by actually using factorization instead of just a plain relational representation of data. And uh, uh, in the context of this, I will also talk about so-called worst-case optimal join algorithms. 
What are these algorithms? Well, these are optimal in the sense that they need exactly time proportional to the size of the result. They don't, take more, they don't need more time. Yeah? This is a very important aspect which has been actually overlooked in more than three decades of database research. So systems like Postgres, uh, IBM DB2, Microsoft SQL Server, they construct so-called query plans, right? Binary, by using binary joints of tables. But in fact, uh, they are not uh, optimal. In the sense that they may compute intermediate results which are larger, asymptotically larger than the final result. Yeah? And this can be avoided. And the gap here being asymptotic, it means that in practice, if you pump more data in the database, means you can get you know, larger gaps in performance. Yeah? So this is in fact very interesting, in particular, given the fact that uh, such algorithms have been developed only very recently, at least in the database context. But we will see they, they actually rely on uh, uh, work done in theoretical computer science and algorithms done even uh, uh, six, seven decades ago, right? In geometry and, uh, well, also in geometry, not only in, in theoretical computer science, right? But I will, I will actually go over them a bit. The second part, which hopefully will be covered tomorrow completely, and then the third part on optimization will be covered on, on which will be covered on, on Saturday, will build on this, yeah? So, the structure for today is this. I will talk, I will give you a very brief introduction to what is a joint query. Yeah? Then uh, I will show you some examples. Then uh, we look at uh, this decompositions of queries that take advantage of the sparsity in the result of the join, right? So, a sort of structural decomposition, if you like. Uh, and then we, we will see how we can use these decompositions to bound the sizes of join results. To give upper bounds and then we will see we can also, for uh, reasonably many databases, we can actually meet this upper bound with the lower bound. So essentially these size bounds will be tight. And then we'll see how we can meet these tight size bounds with computation, by computing the results in this time, in the same time as their size, essentially, okay? And at the end, there are a couple of open-ended open -ended issues. I'm not sure whether I will get there, but in case I get there, they are also very, very fascinating, I would say. Right? You will see you can even go further, and there is so much one, one can do in this space, in fact. Right? Uh, a common theme here is that, uh, although you know, I will lose perhaps uh, database slang, these problems are so fundamental to computer science that they pop up everywhere. Right? So, by no means you should assume that if you just listen to this, oh, you'll get some knowledge of databases only. No, these techniques you can actually apply in a lot of other areas of computer science. So it's actually time well spent, in my opinion. Okay? Good. So let us actually understand what is a query. Yes? You can mention that the slides are online. Oh, yes. So this is another issue, you're right. So I aim to put the slides online before the, the lecture. Okay? So in case you have iPads or anything, right, uh, you can actually see the slides and you can take notes on the slides if you feel like it, okay? So they are already online, for instance, all this, uh, the, the, the slides uh, I'm, I'm using today. Is the, is the one of the web page. The, if, you, if you Google search uh, PhD Open Warsaw, uh, most likely you get to one of these pages and from there you find the, 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 this particular uh, course and then uh, uh, at the very bottom is part one. Good, so what do I mean by joint queries? I really mean this, so imagine, okay, yeah, imagine I have actually a conjunction of so-called relational atoms, R1 to Rn, that R, each of them is over a set of variables, A1 to An, right? So this conjunction would essentially say this, uh, I look at, uh, you know, tuples in R1, R1 being a, a relation, right? I look at tuples in Rn, and I consider those valid combinations to be part of the result. What do I mean by a valid combination? If, for instance, I have a, a variable, let's say, a, a, a customer here in R1, and customer in Rn, I expect the customer value to be the same. So they are consistent. So 
tuples which are consistent across the variable, the, the, the relations, if you put them together in a big tuple over all the variables in the, uh, you have in the body of the query, you get, in fact, a tuple in the result, right? So essentially, uh, if you like, if you think of all possible satisfying assignments of the variables in the query, two values in the domain, right? Which is the database, okay? So that's the way, and I will show you examples, right? In this particular case, all these variables A1 to AN, they also appear in the head, right? That is, we want to report their values in the result. In this sense, it is a joint query. Now, there are notions like conjunctive queries, which uh, might puzzle you because this is a conjunction. It's a conjunctive query. Conjunctive query actually means a bit more than this. It means that the variables in the head, right, may not necessarily be all the variables in the body of the query, right? There may be less variables in the head. So some variables are bound, are aggregated away, yeah? Uh, think of it as a form of projection. You project away some columns from the input database, okay? So that's the notion. Are there questions about this notion of, of join, of join queries? Should be fine, fine, okay? I'll give you here a couple of examples. So here are the bodies of some queries. For instance, I have a relation O, which stands for orders, with three variables, customer, day, and dish. Then I have one uh, a relation D, big D, standing for dishes, with dish and item as variables, and I for items with item and price, okay? So what are the joints? The fact that I have the same variable here in D and in I, item, means that I join these two tables, these two relations, on that column, okay? The fact that I have dish in O and dish in D, it means I join orders and dishes on that dish column, okay? And the joints here are all equality-based joints. You want to have the same value, okay? So uh, another path query, which goes from, you know, you have two variables A, B, and then you have B, C, and then you have C, D. You can see this as a sort of path, if you like, in a graph, right? You go, you hop from A to B, and then B to C, and C to D. And you like to see whether such a path exists or such a walk exists, right? Um, this is another query, uh, which is similar to the previous one, this one is an important query, the triangle query, which we will see actually in depth because there are actually quite interesting complexity results coming uh, uh, with it. Uh, you have basically an edge between AB, an edge between AC, and an edge between BC. So it, you form a triangle. If you consider the relations R1, R2, R3 as being just the binary edge relation of a graph, you look for triangles in a graph, right? And questions we will look here would be, you know, how many triangles can you get, right? How fast can you compute these triangles, okay? So that is actually a very interesting question, which uh, turns out to be uh, evaluated suboptimally by existing uh, relational database management systems. And we'll get to that today. And there is also a loop query, right? You go from A1 to A2, then from A2 to A3, from A3 to A4, and then back to A1. So you form such a cycle of length four. This is also a very interesting query. We'll look uh, at it uh, in more detail. Good. So I will show you now how to do query evaluation. I mean, at least, you know, what means to do query evaluation for uh, one of our queries. I take the query with orders, right? So I have orders, dish, and items. I, he I give here some tuples that should make sense, like customer Alice on, on, uh, on the day Monday ordered this dish burger. Now, the dish burger has these particular items uh, as components, patty, onion, and bun. And uh, in the other relation, we actually st store the prices. That patty has a certain price, onion another price, and bun another price, and so on and so forth, right? So we have such information. If we want to do the join of these tables, what we get effectively is this. We get Alice with Monday and burger. Now, this tuple is combined with all the tuples that have dish burger. And for each of these items, we look up in the items and get the price. So effectively, we, we end up creating such a big table. So Alice on Monday ordered, ordered burger, and burger has these components. But also on Friday, she ordered burger and has these components with these prices, right? One thing that is striking here, right, is the amount of redundancy. Yeah? 
Look at the redundancy, right? Because of the relational encoding tuple by tuple, we have to actually state at least so many times the fact that you know she ordered on Monday as many times as components are in a burger, and then you know because on, on Friday she ordered again burger again, you repeat the whole information. And we'll see there is a systematic way to get rid of this. But for the time being, this is the way you know a query result looks like, a join result looks like, right? A long list of tuples. Good. Um, now another one. Imagine now the triangles. I want, I have these three relations, R1, R2, R3, A over A, B, A, C, and respectively B, C, and imagine this content of the relations. So essentially what I have here, I have A0 paired with B0 to BM, and A1 to AM paired with B0. So in a sense, A0 appears very many times here, right? And now B0 appears very many times, okay? So it is as if I have these two partitions of each relation uh, one partition, in one partition, A1 appears very many times. We will see later, we call this a heavy value. And in the other partition, B0 appears very many times. So B0 is heavy, yeah? And, and similarly for R2, A0 appears very many times with Cs, and then C0 appears very many times with As, yeah? And similarly for R3. So if we want to compute the result here, okay? What do we do? We say A0, B0. A0, C0, so they match on A0. And now we search whether B0, C0 also appears in this relation R3. And it does, so we have A0, B0, C0 appearing in the result. So we do all these things. Uh, now, one interesting aspect, which I will come back to, is the following, that these relations, if you look at each of them, their sizes are about, you know, um, if I'm not mistaken, 2M plus 1, right? We have M plus 1 here and M there, so 2M plus 1. Same, similarly for R2 and R3, 2M plus 1. Uh, for the result, if you look a bit there, you'll find it's something like uh, 6M plus 3 or so. Yeah? So the input is actually uh, linear in M. Output is linear in M. But if you try to do, for instance, any two of them, to join any two relations first, it will blow up. For instance, if you take R1 join with R2, you join on A, because A is the join variable common to both. You realize A0 appears M plus 1 times. A0 appears M plus 1 times here. So you get a blow up. You get M plus 1 squared, right? Only for that part, OK? So here you see an instance where the intermediate result may be larger than the final result, asymptotically larger. We get quadratic versus linear in this case, OK? And I will, I will uh, you know, challenge you to look after the, 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 the course at home to realize that any other combinations of these three relations will give you the same problem. That is, the intermediate result will be quadratic, but the final is linear. Yeah? Good. So let us now look at the compositions. For the compositions, first of all, I have to introduce uh, the notion of a joint hypergraph. This is a sort of a gra uh, a graph notion of of the query. You look at the query, and you see the query as follows. Every variable in the query is a node, and every relation, which is in fact a set of variables, right, is a hyper edge. Yeah? It's not an edge. It would be an edge if you know every relation would have two variables, and you can draw an edge between the two variables. But if you have several variables in a relation, you cannot just draw an edge between all, all of them. This edge is in fact a hyper edge. It's like a set containing all the nodes representing the variables in that relation, okay? So it's a very simple notion, but we will make use of it extensively. For instance, if we take our triangle query, <clears throat> our variables will be A, B, C. So these are the nodes. And now the hyper edges will be, we have a hyper edge here which goes over A, B, which we can also give it a name, it's R1. Then AC is R2, and uh, this one here, BC, is R3, okay? So we write it like this. The set of nodes is ABC. The set of uh, hyper edges or edges would be AB, the set AB, the set AC, the set BC, okay? Good. So another example, order query, you know, you can put customer, day, dish, item, and price as, as, the, as the actual variables, so the nodes. And then you draw the hyper edges. For instance, the O relation has customer ID, so there is a set 
going over all three of them. So that's a hyper uh, uh, graph as well. Okay, good. Now we would like to decompose these hypergraphs. In general, hypergraphs may be may, may contain cycles, for instance, right? But we would like to decompose them into trees. In a way, why tree? Well, tree is an easier data structure than the graph. On trees, you can do computation easier than you can do on the graph. Yeah? Imagine on a tree, <clears throat> such as, for instance, uh, if I go back, this, part, uh, uh, this particular tree here, right? you can easily solve this query. You can go bottom up on it, right? and you can actually do a join between I and D, a join between, after that, O on the result of joining I and D, and then you are, you are done. If you have a graph with cycles, it's a bit more complicated. Yeah? You, you wouldn't know how to, where, where to start, where to end. So it's a rather principled approach to try to transfer, transform graphs into trees, because trees you know, have some sort of locality property, right? You can do some local computation. You don't care about the rest, because you are not connected to the rest, right? You just start bottom up. You know you are only connected to your parent. You do whatever you have to do locally. You transfer the knowledge you gained to the parent. And then you go on like this until you reach a root. And that's it. You are done. If you have a graph, you have to remember that, you know, if you go up that way, you are also connected with some other parts, right? So it makes it more complicated. And this remembering is actually uh, 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 tricky because it requires space and time. This hyper decomposition of, of a hypergraph, I call this tau of a hypergraph, which is given by the set of nodes and its hyper edges, is just a pair of a tree t and chi. This chi is actually a function that maps each node in our tree to a set of nodes in the original hypergraph. And this is, for historical reasons, called bag. But it's, it's really a set, but it's called bag. Okay? You have, we, have, we have now to just admit that, that this is the way people called it a long time ago. In fact, it doesn't even come from the 99 paper. People looked at other notions of decompositions before, uh, and they also used the, uh, this uh, term as bag. And I will give you an example here. So, this particular, okay, so a tree and a function mapping this. And you will see there are actually three important properties that actually must hold for this hyper tree to be really valid. But let me, let, let me first give you this. So this is the hypergraph of our path query. So we had A to B, B to C, and C to D. You see the hyper edge over AB, over BC, and the CD, right? We can construct a hyper tree, the composition as follows. AB will be part of a bag. BC is part of a bag, and CD is part of a bag. This is a path, a special case of a tree, which actually satisfies two important properties. One property is that if you look at each hyper edge in the original hypergraph, its variables are included in one of the bags, one of the nodes of the decomposition. Okay? In particular, yes, I mean, AB from here is included here, BC is here, CD is there. Another important property which is the so-called running intersection property, RIP, RIP, which doesn't mean rest in peace in this case, right? Um, which is also called connectivity, is ex essentially saying this, that if you have a variable appearing in several bags, then uh, these bags must form a connected subtree. That is, if you have a variable, a variable A here and variable A there, then all the nodes in between must have variable A. Essentially, the intuition for this is, is as follows. If you want to do some computation here over A, but you also have A somewhere there, you have to remember what computation you did for each A. So you have to pass that, informa that information along right, the tree, the composition, until the other bag that has the, the, the variable. Okay? So think of this in terms of the message passing algorithm used to do you know, uh, uh, marginalization and a lot of other things in AI, right? It's exactly the same idea. You have to be able to pass the knowledge along the edges, but in order to pass that means that all the intermediate nodes must remember A, because without that A, you know, I mean, it, do, it, do, it doesn't make sense that suddenly you have information about A here, you want to transfer it there, you go along the, the, the path, and you don't, you don't carry it with you, and suddenly it appears, magi you know, it appears magically at the end. It doesn't work, right? So you have to carry it along. Carrying along, it means A must be in between. Yeah? So this is the connectivity property. 
Good. So let me actually go yeah, to the next slide and uh, show you another example. So this is the triangle query. And now we want to construct a hyperty decomposition for it. Well, it turns out that this is the hyperty decomposition for it. Yeah? It's just one node containing all three variables. And why is that? Because if you try to put them in any path or any tree structure you like, this connectivity property forces you eventually to have uh, each variable in all, every node, in every bag. It is as if you have just one node with all the variables, instead of having redundant uh, 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 bags which contain you know, some, of the, some of these uh, variables. Right? So in particular, uh, this is a valid decomposition by, trivially because you know, it contains all the, all the hyperages, right? and it is connected. Yeah. yeah, There is a single node. Good. So there is an alternative notion, an equivalent, in fact, notion. Yes? Uh, I mean, you can always do it, right? You can always put all of your variables into one file yeah. and say that that's a tree, right? That's yeah. not very interesting. Yeah, it's not very interesting. You are right. You are definitely right about that. It turns, I mean, our aim is to always try to find smarter decompositions, better decompositions, because by decomposing, it means that we, we can exploit locality of computation, right? Some things are independent of other things given their ancestors, right? Uh, here, it turns out we cannot do better, yeah, unfortunately. This is a click. And in general, if you have clicks, you cannot really break them down easily into trees. Yeah? Good. So um, let me now go to, the, to an alternative notion, which is actually more amenable, as we will see even more evidently next uh, uh, session, for when, when, so, so when we'll do variable elimination. Is, this is called variable order. Right? So we look at the variables in our query, and we establish an order on them. This may be a partial order, uh, which would make explicit the conditional independence we have in the data. Right? So in particular, a variable order, we call it delta, big delta, right, for a query queue, is a pair of a rooted forest f and a function similarly to the chi mapping we had there. Here we have another mapping of each variable to a subset of its ancestor variables. So um, there are also two properties here, which I'll come back uh, in a second to them. Um, this is, for instance, one variable order for our path query. A, B, B, C, C, D. It's essentially going A, B, C, D. A total order. We just assume an order. We can take actually any permutation, uh, uh, actually A, B, C, D, in this case, right? And put a total order there. But we may, be, we, we may be able to give other variable orders, such as this one here, where we say, oh, B is a root, and then we have A, C, D. Intuitively, what it means is here, it means that if B is set to a constant, then A is independent of C and D. Because indeed, if you look in the original query, and you consider that you break down the B, B, you set it to a constant, then the A's you have on this side will not influence in any way the pair CD you have on the other side, and vice versa. OK? So that's the locality we, we want to exploit, right? But there is a, a wrinkle to this. You know, we want to be able to encode this conditional independence. And we do this to some extent in such trees by having branching. But there is much more to it. And this is given by this uh, function called key, which I will explain in a second. This function key maps each variable to a subset of its ancestors on which it depends, essentially, right? What does it mean, dependence? If you have two variables, let's say A, B, and they appear in the same relation, you cannot say anything about their independence. You cannot say that one is independent of the other, because in general, there may be some correlations between the possible values of A and of B, OK? So you assume that they are dependent, so you put them along the same path in this variable order. But if they come in different relations, they may be independent. Right? In particular, if you look here at R1AB and R2BC, just at these two relations, you join them, given a B, A is independent of C. This is the conditional independence we want to exploit. Right? And we want to encode, and we encode it in the, in the graph, in the tree, but in this partial order effectively, which is the, the variable order, but we can also encode it in this key information. In particular, um, uh, for each relation symbol, its variables would lie along the same root to leaf path, as I mentioned, in F. And for any such variables A, B that appear in the same relation, A is in the key of B if A is an ancestor of B. 
You have to have this condition. So that's the way you populate key. But in addition, there is something else, namely that for every child B of a node A, right, its keys are included in the key of A, union A itself. That is, you have to inherit somehow the dependencies of your children. Right? This is exactly the connectivity property we had, in fact, for the, for the, for the hyperty decompositions. So in this particular case here, for instance, we have A, B, C, D, and we know that D depends only on C because D and C appear together in the same relation. Uh, and Q of D is included in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in Q of C and C because in the Q of D is exactly C, right? Q of C depends, uh, is actually B because uh, uh, C and B appear in the same relation, yeah? And uh, Q of C is included in Q of B and B because B is B, right? And similarly for B and A. So that is the, the, the key dependency. So although I put here a total order, a path, I use the keys here to encode this conditional independence. In other words, if I decide to fix B to a value, right, then the A's will be independent of C and D because, you see, if you look at the keys of C and D, they don't depend on A, right? So this is another way of encoding the same type of conditional independence we've seen in the hyper tree uh, 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 de uh, de uh, decompositions. In this case here of this, uh, of this other variable order, right, Q of B is empty because this is the root. It doesn't depend on anything else. Q of A is B because A and B come in the same relation. Now Q of D is C and Q of C is B. But this we use branching here, right, to exploit the fact that we have some independence that can be captured as a tree and not necessarily uh, by, 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 by means of keys. Good. I know this is a bit dry, but believe me, this is actually important for later on because all algorithms will do, for instance, to compute queries to uh, do counting, to do sums, one second, yeah, and the rest, they are just using such structures. So they go bottom up or top down over these structures and end up with the result. In particular, this variable order gives rise to, to a natural variable elimination algorithm where you look at the very top and you eliminate the B first, right? You iterate over all the possible Bs you have. And for each B, you look in this branch for the A's and on the other branch for C's and D's. And that's it. So if you are able to find a very good variable order or alternatively a hyper decomposition and you understand the uh, various notions like weeds, that is, you know, what is the complexity to process the data using such a decomposition or a variable order, you know the complexity of solving your problem. And there, are, there is a lot of work showing that this comp in most cases you, there are lower bounds for, for this, right? So you cannot get better. So understanding such ways of decomposing problems is actually a very useful thing. Yes, there was a question at the very end. So I, I have to make sure that uh, variables appearing in the same relation, they are along the same root to leaf path because in general they are not independent of each other. Their dependency is uh, stated in the relation R, right? So this is where we state all their possible assignments together. So this is a very, very strong uh, 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 limitation for how you can construct the trees, right? And then in addition uh, to this, you would like to refine this, this structure you get by taking root to leave pass for every relation by also considering uh, this key information which capture, uh, captures additionally some uh, uh, independence, conditional independence. Yeah, okay, good. Good, so um, another uh, uh, query here, this is the triangle query. For the triangle query, this is a possible variable order, A, B, C, but key, uh, 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 the key of C is A, B, because A, B, no, C appears with each of A, B in a relation, right? C appears with B in relation R3 and appears with A in relation R2. So it must be that in the key of C, we have both A and B. In the key of B, we have only A. In the key of A, we have nothing because this is the root. Another uh, uh, possible uh, uh, you know, variable order is BAC or CBA. But in all these cases, if you look at the leaf, 
the leaf depends on everything above, on all the ancestors. Yeah? And, and, and this is it. You cannot do better than that. So you cannot actually uh, uh, break it down into easier pieces, you know, by, by branching or by having keys which are not the ancestors. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so you have here that um, uh, 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 for any such variables, A and B, A belongs to the key of B if A is an ancestor of B. What do you mean such variables here? Uh, for variables that are in the same relation. For each relation symbol, wow. its variables uh, 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 lie along the same root to leaf path in F. And for any such variables A and B, any, any pair from the same relation, you get this. Yeah. Good. So now I will actually show you that the, the two notions are in fact equivalent. So whenever you actually see an algorithm that says, hey, I work with variable orders, because I do variable elimination AI, for instance, and these people in databases uh, actually, or uh, CSP, they work with the hyper decompositions, this must be different notions. In fact, no, they are the same. You can easily translate from one to the other, okay? So uh, and it is actually very simple. So. Um, imagine we are given a, a, a variable order delta and we want to construct a hyper decomposition tau from it. Then for every node in the variable order, uh, we create a bag, uh, which is its keys and the, 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 the actual node itself. And uh, the bag for A will be then connected to the bags for its children and parents. Yeah? So optionally, we might remove bags, which are contained in other bags because they are, they are redundant. So for instance, if we have the triangle query, and this is our variable order with these keys, we take AB, which is the key of, of C, and C itself, and create a bag with it. B with the key of B, which is A, we create a bag. And A with empty set, we create a bag. This has A, A, B, A, B, C. But A and A, B are included anyway in A, B, C, right? So you could easily just remove these uh, redundant bags, right? So you can end up with A, B, C. Yeah? Because if you think about it, you know, the most complex operation you have to do will be on this bag ABC anyway. So you wouldn't need to do, you know, also for a, for a subset of it, some work. Um, another uh, example is the path query. This is the, the uh, a variable order for the path query. So here we take Q of D and, and, and D, which is CD, Q of B and, and uh, uh, Q of C and C, which is BC, AB and A. And then we realize that A is actually contained in AB. We can drop it, and then we get, at the end, a, a hyper decomposition. Now, let us look uh, the other way around. So for hy from hyper decompositions to variable orders. Uh, so what we do is as follows. We create a node, A, in delta, right, for a variable A in the top bag of, of, of our hyper decomposition. So we have a hyper decomposition, which is a tree. We look at the top. We say, let me take a variable from it. I take the variable, this is the root of my variable order, and I recurse with the rest. That is, I take that variable, in this case A, from all the bags, I take it away because I already eliminated it, right? I'm ended up, I end up with actually simpler hyper decomposition, which may be in fact uh, 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 disconnected. There may be disconnected components there, because A may actually be the glue holding together the whole thing, right? And then, if it is disconnected, I then branch out in my variable order. I create a branch for one part and a branch for the other part of the hyper decomposition without A. Okay? And if the top bag is empty, then I recurse to its children, and so on and so forth. So I will show you examples here. So again, with the triangle query A, B, A, C, B, C, this is our uh, uh, hyper decomposition. And um, what I do is this. I remove A and I insert it into delta. So this is the root, okay? And I take it away, as you see, I, I shaded it away, right? So it's not anymore in my bag. So now I take B, and I create it there. So now I know that B depends on A because they were in the same bag anyway. And then I actually have C, and I know that C B, uh, depends on both A and B. So I create the, uh, uh, the keys in this way, yeah? So that's the way you can get it. But you can get in any other order you like, of, of course, here. Good, so for the path query, you know, we have A, B, B, C, C, D. 
we have, uh, uh, so this would be our uh, 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 hyperty decomposition. So what do we do? We take A, we put it as the root, and then we take B, we eliminate B from both bags, the top and the, and the child bag, and uh, put it in the, in the variable order. And now we are left with C and CD. Below, we take C, and then we take D. Yeah? And then we can do it both ways. So now, essentially, whatever algorithm you develop for one formalism could be, in fact, applicable to the other uh, uh, formalism as well. But some, some algorithms actually are more amenable to one than the other, in fact, right? And uh, in my research so far, I had to use both in some context because it was easier to explain some things in, in one way or the other. And I will show you an example today, in fact, yeah, of using variable orders. Good. Okay, so we are now um, uh, uh, done with the decompositions. Are there questions about decompositions? Is it clear? I hope so, right? So let us go to size bounds. So here, the question is this. Can we bound the size of the result of a join? Where we assume for the beginning, let's say that uh, uh, all uh, relations have the same size n, and then we can further refine this. Yeah, by allowing each variable, uh, each uh, relation to have a different uh, size. Good. So um, let us look to understand the, 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 the challenge at the path query. We have this path query A, B, B, C, C, D. Yeah? We say all relations have size n. Okay? So how can we give an upper bound for this? Imagine the following. Imagine I take the Cartesian product of R1 and R3, right? So that is also a way to, I, I could compute this, uh, the, this query. I take R1 and R3, all possible combinations of A, B on one side and C, D from the other side, and I use R2 as a filter so that only those combinations of C, D that appear in R2 should be considered. But if I do this, effectively I get an upper bound of N square because I, I combine R1 and R3, right? R1 and R3, and I use R2 as just as a filter. I just do a lookup in R2 and check, oh, is that pair CD in there or not? If it is, then I keep the tuple, otherwise I drop it. Yeah? So that's a way we, we can do it. And that gives us an upper bound of N square. Yeah? And in fact, what we did implicitly was this. We wanted to find relations that cover all the variables we have in our query. So that is, the variables can actually draw uh, va values from these relations. And if we feed them enough, right, I mean all variables can get values from some relation, then we, we reach an upper bound. Because everything else from the query can be seen as a constraint. Further constraint that can only constrain which possible values my variables can take. Yeah? So that's the way I did it. So in effect what I really did is to take a cover, an edge cover, of my hypergraph, right? So effectively, I wanted to cover all the nodes, which are the variables in my query, by hyper edges. And an edge cover is exactly this. I have to make sure I can cover all the nodes by some hyper edges. And I would like to limit the number of hyper edges I use to cover, right? And those hyper edges correspond to relations, and if I take their sizes and I multiply, I get an upper bound. And that's the idea, okay? What about a lower bound? Well, in case of a lower bound, um, I could also do a trick. I can say that I can construct certain types of databases for which I cannot get better, that is uh, 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 lower than, again, n square. And here is one such class of databases. So what I do is in R1 I say I have uh, A, the A column has all the values from 1 to N, yeah? And the, the B column has only a single value, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, everywhere, yeah? This uh, 1 to N set, I represent it by this, uh, you know, square brackets N, yeah? And then I take a, a basically a, a, a Cartesian product with the set 1 to just say that this is a relation of, of size N and has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 until uh, N, and on B has only 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, okay? I do for R2 something similar. I take B to be only value 1, and C to be again 1 to N. And for the third relation, I take C to be again from 1 to N, and D to be just 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And for this database, if you actually take the, the join, 
you will see that you will get a, a, a size of uh, n square, right? Why so? Because I have n a's which are paired with n c's, right? In all possible ways. Okay? And it's quadratic. This means that for this particular query, I can say, you know, confidently that, well, in worst case, you cannot do better than n square. You know? And the algorithm I just mentioned to you that actually uh, takes a, a Cartesian product of R1 and R3 and then uses R2 as a filter is, in fact, in a sense, you know, uh, asymptotically the best we can hope for. In practice, you might want to do better, obviously, by using selectivities of the joints and so on and so forth. But from the purely point of view of, you know, complexity, you know, you cannot get better than that, than, than n square. Okay? Good. So what about uh, the triangle? Well, in case of the triangle, all relations have size n, right? Uh, the query result, sim I use a similar reasoning as the, as the previous, uh, in, for the previous case. I say that uh, if I take the relations R1 and R3, which anyway cover all the variables, and I take their Cartesian product, and I use relation R2 only as a filter, okay, I get essentially an upper bound of n square as well. Yeah? But what about lower bounds? Well, one lower bound I could come up with is this. You know, I take A to be 1 to N, B to be just value 1, and, uh, uh, and that's it. You know, A everywhere is 1 to N, B everywhere is just uh, 1, and the C's can be uh, here also 1. Yeah? In fact, R3 can be anything that contains at least the tuple 1, 1, so that I can join with B equals 1 and C equals 1 from the other relations. Yeah? Okay? So then, if you look at this, you get actually a linear uh, lower bound, uh, n. The lower bound is n. And the question is, can we do better? Can we actually come up with a smarter uh, class of data? Well, smarter is not, but you know, with, with, with a class of databases which would uh, you know, increase a bit the lower bound, which will make it closer to our upper bound, right, is the question. And in fact, yes, if you think a bit about it, you can take perhaps square root of n values for a, square root of n values for b and square root of n values for c, right? And if you take the join of this, you get something like square root of n times square root of n times square root of n, which is n to 3 over 2. Yeah, you could get that. So there are classes of databases for which we can actually improve the lower bound, but still, it doesn't actually match our upper bound. So there is a gap here, right, between the lower bound and the upper bound. And is this actually necessarily so? Is, is, is a very important question, which we will address in a, in a second. Before that, let me go back and try to explain what I did. First of all, I hope I explained enough that uh, the way we want to get the upper bounds is by means of edge covers, yeah? But in order to get the lower bounds, what we did is by means of uh, independent sets. We looked in the hypergraph and we took notes which are independent, they don't appear in the same uh, hyperedge. And uh, uh, we essentially said, how many of these can we get? And we try to increase their, uh, increase their number. And the more we get, the better the lower bound was. I mean, the better in the sense that it was a higher uh, lower bound. Yeah? So in fact, what we played here with was coming from above with, a, with an edge cover, coming from below with, a, uh, with an independent set. We wanted to minimize this and maximize that and we wanted them to meet. But in fact, if you think about that, the uh, maximum independent set is not necessarily the same as the minimum edge cover number, okay? There is a gap, and this is well known in, in, in graph theory, yeah? And uh, uh, this is for the case where these numbers are actually natural numbers, right? Okay? Uh, but uh, if we take actually fractional versions of them, then they might meet. And that's the, the kind of uh, 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 punchline of uh, uh, work done about 10 years ago by Atelias Gray and, Mark, uh, and Marx, based on actually work done way before. Uh, even in 49, uh, people worked on this uh, problem, but in geometry. Uh, and, um, and it's actually uh, quite interesting that if you look at the integral versions of these problems, independent set and edge cover, you get a gap, 
But if you look at the fractional versions of them, they meet. Yeah? And let me explain more. So um, these two bounds meet if we take the fractional versions. And uh, that means a fractional edge cover. What does it mean a fractional edge cover? It means that a node may be covered only fractionally by some edges. But overall, we want each node to be covered fully. But let's say I cover it half with a relation and half with another relation. OK? It's like A in R1 has only square root of n values and has square root of n values in R2, for instance, right? So half from one side, half from the other. Together, they cover the whole n possible values for A, let's say, right? Or you know, overall the domain A. Right? Uh, similarly, we take a fractional independent set, and then that could actually increase a bit our, uh, um, well, could make our, our, our bounds uh, meet. And by duality of linear programming, because you know these fractional versions, for each of them you can actually write down a linear program. By duality of linear programming, one being a, maximal, uh, a maximization problem, the other one a minimization problem, which one can you know, we, transfer, we, we can translate easily from one to the other. This uh, 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 values actually meet, yeah, at optimality. And that is what people call the fractional edge cover number, rho star, which, as we will see, is a very important width measure for the query, telling us how large the size of the query result can actually be. Yeah? So, this is the linear program we do now. So um, we have our query, general query, with R1 and Rn uh, uh, hyperages or relations, right? The, the, the variables are this A1, An, you know, the union of all the, the sets A1 to An. And this row star is the cost of an optimal solution to this linear program. So what we want to do, we want for every hyperedge to associate a weight x underscore uh, 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 the, the, the relation name. This weight must be positive. And we want to minimize the sum of all the weights of our hyperages. Yeah? Ideally, we would like to set some of the weights to zero if, if it works out, right? But we have to make sure that each node is covered by a weight, an aggregated weight of at least one. And this is where the drama comes, right? Because if we don't have this less constraint, then we can set all the weights to zero and that's it. Yeah? But we want every single node to be covered. That is, every single variable should be able to draw values from some relations and enough values. Right? So in other words, we minimize this sum. This is subject to two constraints. This constraint I already mentioned, that the weights associated to the hyperages must be positive. And the second one is that if you look essentially at each node, let's say node A, right? if you look at all relations covering that node, that is, this uh, uh, node is in these uh, edges, right? The sum of the weights of these hyperedges must be uh, greater than one, greater or equal to one, actually. Greater than or equal to one, okay? So that's the, the, the whole thing. And what we did before when we looked at the integral versions of the, of the independent set, maximum independent set and uh, minimum edge minimal edge cover, we took the integral version of this program, where x, the, the weights xri were not some real numbers greater than zero, but they were either zero or one. So either you took a relation or you didn't take the relation. But now we say we can take relations fractionally. Okay? Good. So, so that's about it. And let's see this in action. So here is a, yes? You, you, you can take the values above one, but why, why would you ever take them above one? Because you know the constraint says every uh, node should be covered by at least one, so the, the, it, it doesn't make sense to as associate more weight than one to a, to, a, to an edge. You see what I'm saying? And negative, well, it's, it's part of the of the problem setting that they, they have to be positive. So you have, you know, the meaning is you actually have to, you know, the relation or that hyperation should give some values to the variable, not take away. Yeah. Other questions? Good. So that is actually seminal work that has been, believe me, you know, cited very many times, yeah, 
and actually has influenced a lot of researchers out there. And there are many papers essentially falling back to this, right? And, you know, in hindsight, it's a very elegant and simple solution, right? Um, and, uh, but, but only in hindsight, yeah? So, okay, let, so let me take you, uh, take you through an example. We have this query. So we have R, A, B, C. So A, B, C has this hyperage, which is a bit fat, you know, but I couldn't draw it easier, you know. It was in early days when I, you know, started uh, learning TIGS picture, and it's not so easy. Uh, then A, B, D, then A, E, and E, F. Yeah? So we have such a hypergraph. And now let us think about computing this fractional edge cover number. What, what could we do? We could do the following. We could say, oh, let me actually associate the weight of 1 to R, to S, and to U. If I do that, I cover essentially all nodes and each of them by a weight of at least 1. In fact, some nodes are covered by a weight greater than 1 because in case of A and B, because they are part in both, uh, of both uh, uh, R and S, and if I associate with R and, both R and S a weight of 1, then A and B will have a weight of 2 each, right? But we cannot give them lower weight because, you see, C and D also have to be covered. So because C and D, C appears only in R and D appears only in S, we force somehow to associate a weight of 1 to each of R and S, right? We cannot do better than this. So once we deal, deal with that part of the hypergraph, if we look at the other part, A is covered, only E and F remain uncovered. So we can just associate a weight of 1 to U, and, uh, and we are done. So the, the row star, the, the fractional edge cover number in this case will be 3. Because, you know, for the, the hyper HT, we can give a, a weight of 0. Yeah? Because, you know, both E and A are covered enough. Can we do better than this is the question. Not really, because if you look at the independent set here, right, the maximum independent set would be CDF. CDF only appear in one hyper H each, and that's it. And it's already three. So that, that would give us our lower bound. So we cannot do better than this. Yeah? So we can conclude that this is it. This is the best we can hope for. Now, let us now go back to our triangle query. So what happens in this case, this is the, the actual program for it, now spelled out. So what I say is I minimize the weight, the sum of the weights of R1, R2, R3, then subject to the weight of R1 plus the weight of R2 must be greater than or equal to 1. Why? Because R1 and R2 cover A, right? And, you know, the sum of the weights for that would be, uh, uh, should be greater than or equal to 1. Then for B, similarly, XR1 and XR3, the, their sum must be greater than or equal to 1. And for C, similarly. Okay? And we have the additional constraints that each weight must be positive. Yeah? Or zero. Okay? So our previous upper bound was n over 2, uh, n, n squared, sorry, n to the power of 2. Uh, and this we can obtain by, a, by uh, basically giving uh, to any two of the three hyperages a weight of 1. Because, you know, if we, with two relations, we can cover all the variables. But what if now, instead, we give fractional weights. And I already alluded to this when I discussed the, uh, discussed the lower bound for the triangle query. The weights we could give here would be half, one half for every uh, uh, hyper edge. So if we give one half for R1, one half for R2, and one half for R3, we actually get the sum of the weights 3 over 2. And in fact, right, this is the fractional edge cover number, 3 over 2 which is better than n squared. What are the implications of this? Well, first of all, it is somehow you know, intuitive that you know, we, we join two relations previously, but we use the third relation as a filter. But we use this as a filter a sort of you know, after we did the harm, joining the two relations. So we might construct something very large only later to filter out a lot. Yeah. And in geometry, people knew about this, so they, they were smarter, and they already knew about the result of 3 over 2. In databases, it didn't really happen that way, right? So these days, if you actually try to run a, a query like this, a triangle query, with Postgres, it will give you, essentially, you construct basically a, 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 a query plan by joining two of the relations, and then the result joining with the third relation. And that's a problem. Okay? Yes? 
n. n. N is the size uh, of, the, of these relations, right? Each relation has size n, essentially, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, we made this assumption, yeah. That's true. I, I, I will refine that a bit later. But for the time being, you just have to assume that. But the output size is a function of the input size. And this is what, what we try to, uh, you know. We basically, our problem is, given the input, and input has a, you know, a size n, what is the size of the output as a function of the size of the input? Right? So our function here is n to 3 over 2. Yeah? No, we, we, we talk, uh, you know, in general, we don't talk about, the, about very, very specific databases here, right? Yeah? No? So the analysis we do is this, right? If you give me any database of size n, right, what can you say in worst case about the size of the result? Yeah? And this is what, what we can say. And in particular, we can match this particular, uh, the, the, this upper bound with this, uh, 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 um, database, where every relation is just a Cartesian product of two unary relations. Each of them is, you know, uh, uh, you know, has tuples 1 to square root of n. 1 to square root of n. And if you do this and you take the, 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 the join of all the, these three relations, you get at the end n to 3 over 2 as the number of tuples. So the implication of this actually was this, that when people realize that, well, it's not quite working, and these uh, query optimizers out there are not doing the great job, right? The best job they, they can do. They started inventing new algorithms that attain this bound, you know, that actually reach exactly this uh, complexity. And that is actually the, the way you can inform, uh, you know, uh, practice using theoretical results. And this, I mean, algorithms that, that are worst case optimal for joins are now part of, uh, 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 you know, commercial software. And there are, uh, uh, you know, papers showing how great they are in practice, especially if you try to do queries on graphs, right? Where, 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 where you look at clicks, you look at uh, loops, you look at things like that, right? Triangles and so on, right? You can be way, way better with these algorithms because asymptotically these algorithms behave better than the standard query plans, right, we have in traditional database management systems. Yeah? Okay? Other questions? Okay, good. So is this understood? Yeah, great. Thank you, guys. Yeah. I'm just not sure if this was stated, but the, the claim is that you can do running, uh, you can have an algorithm with running times n to the power of no class. Yeah, yeah. And I will come back to the algorithms that actually can achieve this. And the output size is also rounded to by n. To the rho, rho star, <laughs> exactly. So essentially, these worst-case optimal join algorithms, which I will discuss a bit later, they are worst-case optimal in this sense, that they basically, their, their running time is proportional to the size of the result. Let's actually look at another query. This is a loop four. You know, so we have uh, A1, A2, A2, A3, A3, A4, 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 A1, right? Our loop four query, or uh, um, how to compute the, the fraction edge cover. Here I actually show the linear program to do this. Okay, so this linear program says, I want to minimize the, the sum of the weights of all my hyper edges, of all the relations, subject to these constraints. The, the very bottom, I say that all the weights must be positive. And then in between, I say, look, I look at every single node, every single variable, and I look at which hyper edges contain that variable, and I sum up their weights, and I say that this sum must be greater than or equal to one. And this is what I put in here. You can use any package you like out there to compute this, eigen and so on, right? And you get back a result. And the result in this case is two, and it is intuitive why. You can take either r and t to cover all relations, all, all variables, or you can take w and s to cover them. But if you take any, a subset of this, you'll not be able to, to, do, to achieve the same, yeah? Of these uh, 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 variables, right? And if you assign less weights, you'll also not be able to achieve better. Let's say we assign to R 1 over 2. 
that forces W and S to also have at least one, one over two, okay? Because we have to cover A1 and A2 by a weight of at least one. But then this actually forces T to be at least one over two, and you know, the minimum will be one over two, so then every, every relation there has one over two, the weight, and you know, there are four of them, four times one over two is two, right? And that's it. The interesting thing is, I'm not sure whether I'll have time today, but uh, uh, I would like to <clears throat> show you that if you are not interested in listing all the, all the tuples in the result of the query, you can actually get a better bound. You can decrease from n square to n to 3 over 2, which is, which is fantastic. If you think about it, how is this possible, actually? Uh, the way it is possible is by actually doing a much finer analysis based on the data. You look at the skew in the data, and you treat heavy values, like if you remember the values we discussed in the triangle example, A0 appearing very many times, differently from light values like A1, A2, A3, which appear very, very few times. Yeah? And then if you do this analysis based on the skew, you can get something better. Sorry, you can get something better for what problem? For the problem of the Boolean version of this query. So that is if you want to ask whether the query you know, returns true or false. But the output size bound is still n. Yeah, the output bound size is still n square. You cannot do better. You cannot do better for that. But you could do better for things like Boolean. And I think even for counting, which is nice, right? It says that you know, if you just need, need to count the tuples, you don't need to enumerate them, you can actually do it faster. Yeah? And in fact, a lot of the algorithms you, we will see next uh, uh, session are about counting and summation where you can get way faster than listing the, the tuples, right? And this is actually interesting because, I mean, you know, so there is one guy I work with in this company, and he tells me all the time, you know, as a mantra, and now, now I believe it. He tells me aggregation, yeah, is the aspirin to all problems. Because, you know, honestly, in reality, you don't really see just joints done alone, you know, joints in the wild. No, what you see is Way of, ways of uh, quantitatively, uh, you know, uh, uh, assessing something about some data sets, right? And that ultimately boils down to doing some aggregates, you know, sums, counts, and so on and so forth, right? And for those, we can do actually better. But I'll show you a way to do this better by means of uh, so-called factorization, which should come in, in a couple of slides. Okay, but before that, a historical note on the fraction edge cover number um, so tight size bounds via this rho star parameter have been known for, from earlier works in other contexts. So for instance, in 49, Loomis and Whitney had a, a paper on the famous Loomis-Whitney inequality. Uh, and there is in fact a, a challenge for you in the quiz. Uh, I, I, uh, I design a Loomis-Whitney query and I ask you to actually compute the rho star for it. Yeah? Uh, but then that, that has been actually uh, uh, generalized uh, in a different setting where we look at uh, uh, the number of occurrences of a subgraph in a graph. And this actually has been done by Noga alone in 81, uh, which is basically, you know, if you look, you know, deep enough of this, you know, and you bridge between the various, uh, you know, terminologies, you realize that, uh, that the result has been there. Uh, and then uh, uh, there is even a further generalization of the Loomis-Whitney, which will subsume also this bound, this AGM bound I showed you, uh, by uh, uh, Bolobash and Thomason from 95. These people have barely anything to do with databases, in fact, right? Uh, well, except that, you know, their results are applicable here as well. Uh, and, and if you want a, a recent uh, insightful uh, travel through the history of this result, there is this paper by Hung uh, published in Pods uh, 2018. So all these, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the side uh, references, at the end of the slides you'll find uh, uh, all, the, all the relevant material with links, yeah? So you can click, yeah? And you can go to the right papers. Good. So <clears throat> one of you asked me, okay, oh, you, okay? I don't know your name, but you ask, but you make this assumption that, you know, all, all relations have the same size, n. What if we don't, they don't have the same size? There is, in fact, much work done in this space. And the work actually takes the following uh, shape uh, of so-called constraints. Do you have some cardinality constraints, like sizes of relations may be different, or sizes of projections of relations may be different? Or you know that you have only 10 A's in the database. 
or you know that uh, given a particular A value, you know, you have only 10 Bs, conditional constraints, yeah? And there has been quite a lot of work done, done in this space, in fact, and there are references at the end for this uh, line of work. Here I will only show you the case where relations have different sizes. How can we trivially tweak our linear program to take sizes into consideration? Let us look back at our program. Linear program for our general query is this, right? Minimize the sum of the weights of the hyperages. Assuming all hyperages have the same uh, 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 size, right? The, the, their, their, their support, that is the number of tuples in the relations. Yeah? So we can actually write an equivalent program that says this. Well, instead of minimizing the sum of the weights, let's minimize n, which is the, the, the size of each relation, to the power of the weights, of the sum of the weights. It's the same problem, where n is just, you know, uh, 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 the, 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 the actual same for, the, for, all, for all relations, right? So we can actually massage this a bit. So instead of having n to a power of the sum, we can put the product of n to the power of, uh, of these weights. And now the only change you do, and you have to re really look very, very close to the slide to see the difference, is this, right? N gets an index i, right? Then n i is the relation for, uh, is the size for the relation r i. And that's it. And you now compute this. And this actually makes, makes much more sense, obviously, in practice, where relations may have wildly different sizes. For instance, in, uh, in cases, uh, 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 from experience, uh, if, if you deal with um, data warehousing scenarios, so you have a star schema. That is, you have a very large fact table and a lot of little dimension tables that are linked to the, to the, to the big table. There it makes sense, obviously, to consider that the fact table, the fat fact, fact table is actually way, way larger than the small dimension tables. And you want to account for that when you compute your variable order or, or anything, right, of this sort, yeah? Okay, good. So that would give us the uh, sizes. So now let me tell you a, diff a slightly different story, right? Um, this is a story where we say, okay, we want to, we account for these sizes, right? These sizes exist, we cannot do better than this unless Instead of doing a listing representation of the result, I mean tuple by tuple, we have a much nicer, I don't know, compressed representation of the data. Yeah? That may be way, way more compact. And that is what I call factorized representation. So let me go back and show you this. Our items or the uh, customer orders example, okay? Itemized customer order example. So we have the orders, dishes, and items. We join them. We already looked at this join. We realize there is a lot of redundancy in there. Let's actually get rid of this redundancy. How can we do that? Well, first of all, if I actually, if you allow me to look at this relation and see it as a relational algebra expression using unions and Cartesian products, I would write it like this. So every value becomes a relation of its own, right? With just a single value and a single column. Then a tuple is a Cartesian product of such little relations. And this thing, uh, tuples would represent, you know, unions of such Cartesian products of simple relations. Everyone agrees with that? But now, if you see it algebraically like this, your first temptation is this, right? Or well, at least it was mine, you know? You know, with my knowledge of primary school, I would say, let's apply distributivity, as, you know, associativity, commutativity, prop laws we know for algebra expressions to factor out common terms, right? So that is, I look, oh, Elise, 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 Elise. Can I factor it out? Yes, I can factor out because I understand, you know, how can I factor out in this form, right? Because, you know, I have union and product, Cartesian product. In other words, if you, you know, if you feel more comfortable, think of this as being like, a, a, you know, a summation and multiplication of, in arithmetic expressions, yeah? So we could do that. But there are many ways of doing this, many ways of factorizing. Which one is the best asymptotically? Is, is one, one natural question, right? Okay? And this is one possible factorization. What did I do here? I say, let me look at the actual query that produced that result. Let me actually take a variable order, yeah? In this case, I say, oh, dish, 
day customer item price. And what I do is I mimic this structure into my representation of the data, where I say this. At the end, at the very top, I have a union of all the dishes. Yeah? Then for each dish, I represent the day and customer separately from item and price. So I use a Cartesian product which tells me this information about the day, Monday, Alice, Friday, Alice, right, is independent of the prices and components of a burger. Right? I mean, people will order burger, you know, in my idealized world here, regardless, right, of whether, you know, the burger contains, uh, I don't know, a patty or some bun or something or something else, right? Okay? So that's my idealized word here. Right? In, in practice, you know, people are very picky about things. But, you know, imagine this, this scenario. Okay? So what did I do here? I didn't do anything but this. I say, given a burger, I actually represent symbolically the Cartesian product of the information about day and customer and information about item and price. Right? It's just a symbolic representation. I don't materialize this Cartesian product. This is actually the source of all evil yeah, in databases. This blows up the representation size. Yeah? This Cartesian products, because ultimately a join is nothing but a union of small Cartesian products. You know, some of them larger, some of them smaller, but that's, but that's a join. If you avoid the materialization of this Cartesian product, you may go a long way. Yeah? And that's the thesis of this work. Avoid the materialization. We can do a bit better by using the keys. Here, the keys would be that given uh, uh, an, uh, uh, an item, the dish is independent of the price of the item. So what we do then, we can share information. So what I did here is this, I say, because given a fixed item, like burger, a dish, no, item, sorry, like a, a bun or onion, the dish is independent of the price. That is, you know, if different uh, uh, dishes contain the same uh, items, they will come with the same price in my idealized world. Yeah? Because this is the way I have it in the, in the database, you know, structured that way. Okay? So what, are the, what, what would this mean? It means that under burger and hot dog, Onion will have the same price. So you can share in this representation. Yeah? Okay? Okay? So now a question is uh, what would be the size of it asymptotically, you know, for databases with that structure, with orders, dishes, and items, which is a good question. And that question we will be able to answer by solely looking, uh, you know, for a worst case analysis at the structure given by this variable order. Looking at the variable order, understanding, you know, its structure may give us a notion which is related to this fractional edge cover number, but it may be way, way smaller. So overall, better representation, smaller representation. Okay? So do you understand the actual gist of this? Right? It's a very, very simple application of, uh, of what people do with, uh, with, in this case, semi-rings, right? Okay? To relational data. Good. So, look, same data, different factorization. Here is, I just take a very long path, and I assume that the data is not, uh, uh, you know, I, I don't exploit any sort of uh, conditional independence here. So basically, I have to enumerate the days, and for each day, I look at the, the customer for that day, the, the dish, and then uh, the items in the dish, and then the prices. For Friday, I look at uh, the customer. There are more customers now, then each of them orders some something and so on and so forth, okay? So this is a, a try representation of the data. You know, it's like a tree but misspelled, yeah? Yeah, okay? This is the try. But you can get different tries. However, now, imagine I use the keys. So I know that, in fact, you know, <clears throat> given a, a dish, this information of customers and days is independent of item and price. Then, bang, I get a lot of sharing. So in particular, the burger, burger, you know, is ordered by at least on different days, but the burger content is the same with the prices. In fact, the prices are the same for the components even across different dishes. So you can do a lot of sharing. In general, you can share huge substructures in here, in practice. Yeah? And we will see that this, tomorrow, that this can be actually very effective also for doing various operations like counting. Right? Or like uh, summing up something, right? Like summing up all the prices. 
Yeah? Because you can just go bottom up over this structure, you can easily compute a count. You don't need to enumerate all the possible tuples in the result of this join query, which is compressed here, right, in order to do a count. Imagine this, I have a product, Cartesian product, of two unary relations, you know? This one has size n, this one has size m. Standard in databases, people will take the Cartesian product and then take the count, one plus one plus one plus one plus one, until n times n. Here, the idea is that the Cartesian product stays symbolic, you have n on one side, m on the other side, you count the n, you count the m, the Cartesian product becomes multiplication, you take n times m. So instead of taking one plus one plus one, m times n times, you just do n times m, okay? So that's the, the power of this factorization. And we'll show that we can apply this even to learning machine learning models, actually. And that is the kind of uh, bonus on Saturday. Hopefully that motivates you to come on Saturday as well. Okay, so which factorization should we choose? Well, the size of, of, of a factorization is the number of its values, right? So in this particular case, so we count how many values we have. So for instance, here, if you have a factorization like that, which says I take a product of n values on one side and m on the other, as I explained, then it is n times n. Uh, uh, but, but if I take all possible combination, one and one, one and two, one and three, and so on and so forth, then it's, uh, 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 sorry, so for the first is n plus m, and for the second is n times m. Yeah, so this is where uh, 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 we, we can actually gain asymptotically. So the results are as follows. I want to recall that given a query Q, a join query, and a database of size N, then the join would admit a result that if you list it, right, if, if it has a listing representation, tuple by tuple, is its size is given by this measure, which is the measure we just discussed, which is N to this uh, fractional edge cover number, Okay, but if you do a factorized representation without caching, the caching I showed you, then this rho star is replaced by another width measure, which is S, standing for some factorization width. And this is something we showed some years ago. And after that, there is another one in case we use the caching, and then you get to yet another measure, which you know intuitively should be even smaller. And in fact, there is the following relationship between these measures. On one, at one end, you have the, 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 the worst you can get would be the size of the query, that is the number of relations in the query, as if you take the product, Cartesian product of all the relations, right? At the, at the other end, you get one, because you know, asymptotically, you cannot get better than linear, but that, than seeing every value in the input database. And in between, you have these measures. Here you have a fractional hypertree width, which is the one for, fra for, for factorization with caching, then this is the other one for factorization without caching, and this is our row star measure. What can be the gaps between them? Between the factorization without caching and row star, which is you know for listing representation, the gap can be as large as, well, here it says number of relations in the query, but it's number of relations in the query minus one, in fact, right? So it could be as large as that. Imagine the following. Imagine a Cartesian product of n relations, right? If you want listing representation, you have to materialize these Cartesian products, and that gives you, in the exponent, the number of relations. But if you take a factorization, right, it will just be linear, because you just put symbolic a product with all these relations. You don't need to do anything else, right? Okay? So, uh, so that is an extreme example. But these sort of examples actually, uh, with joints, not only Cartesian products, happen in practice, yeah? What is the gap between, you know, without factorization and with factorization, with, with, without the caching and with caching. Well, it turns out to be, the gap could be up to logarithm on the number of relations in the query. So caching can actually really speed up things a lot. What is caching? Caching is, is what I, sh I showed here before. Well, is this, is, this, is this sharing I showed here before. The fact that you take advantage of this uh, um, uh, conditional independence in the data right, as stated by the, by, by the joint structure, right, to not represent repeating things several times, but only once, and then you just do pointers to what you represented once, yeah? Okay, so is this, is this effectively thing here, right? Okay, so that is caching, we, we call it, you know, sharing caching is, uh, I, I use it in interchangeably. Okay, good, yeah? So you see that the potential, this potential actually translates to aggregates over data. 
but it's actually something much more interesting, namely that uh, you can compute these factorizations directly from the input database, right? Worst case, optimally. So you don't need to compute a very large representation of the result and then compress it. You can compute the compressed form directly and worst case optimally. That is, in a time proportional to the size of that representation, right? And that actually brings a lot of benefits in practice. Good. Uh, and these sizes are, in fact, tight. That is, um, uh, there, are, uh, there exist arbitrary large databases for which the listing representation has the size which is omega of n to rho star, which we have seen before, right, because of the tight size bound. But also for factorization is the same idea, that you can get the same nice uh, uh, tight size bounds. Okay? Good. So are there uh, queries? Not database queries. You know, human queries. No. Okay, so I also want, want, want to draw attention to one important aspect, that uh, these results actually make no um, assumption about the data, right? In practice, you may want to make assumption about the data, but you might not be able to get optimality anymore, as, you know, to get tight results as we get here, right? You may actually make certain assumptions like cardinality constraints, and modulo cardinality constraints, you may be able to come up with tight size bounds, right? And this is what other people looked at, yeah? Uh, but um, uh, if you go deeper uh, and, and try to model what happens in database systems with selectivity uh, of joints, right, and so on, you, you will not anymore get, uh, uh, you know, a sound uh, thing. It will be just be an estimate. You know, so whatever you get out of it will not be, oh, this is the, the tight size bound. No, it will be an estimate of the size of the result, yeah? Which is what traditional database systems work with. They work with estimates. They don't work with actual tight size bounds. Good, so let me actually now explain these two notions of uh, factorization width and this uh, other notion which is called a uh, fractional hypertree width, yeah? Okay, to understand the difference to the fractional edge cover number. And I will give you an example here. I will start with this example. So this is the, the kind of uh, hypergraph we've seen before with relations R, S, T, and U. And this is, let's say, a variable order for it. Okay? So um, the structure of the factorization, if it is R over this variable order, is this. You say, I will take a union over possible A values, and given an A value, I will take a union over B values, and given a B value over union over C values, in a product with the union over D values. And then I go up and I say, this union over B values with all its uh, uh, subtree comes in a product with the union over E values, and for each E value I have F values, right? So this, this basically I read it out from the structure of the variable order, okay? So what would be the size of the factorization? Remember, for fraction, a fractional edge cover number, which is governing the size of the whole query result listed, right? We have to look at the whole query. Here for factorization, we don't have to look at the whole query to understand the size. But rather, for this branch ABC, we only need to look at those relations that come along this branch. Because obviously, right, ABC here is given by R. The size, the, the number of occurrences of a C value is not influenced by the number of occurrences of an E or an F value because they are on a different branch altogether. So in this factorization, we take advantage of the conditional independence we have in the data, yeah? So in other words, we can easily say that the number of C values is upper bounded by, linearly, by the, the size of the relation R, yeah? But not, it's not influenced by T or U in our case, right? For D, similarly, right, the number of values, of D values, right, is upper bounded by the size of S. What about the number of AB values? Well, this is upper bound, they are upper bounded by uh, the intersection of R and S on A and B, right? Okay? So, independently for the other branch, you look at the, at the number of F values, which is essentially upper bounded by, by this subquery that looks at A, E, and F. And what is this subquery that looks at A, E, and F? Well, this subquery is, is the one that joins T and U. Right? So how large can be this size? Uh, can be the, the, the size of this uh, uh, query? Well, T join U can be quadratic. 
right? So the number of f values in general may be quadratically many, right? They may, may, may be quadratic. The number of e values is linear. The number of a values is linear. B, C, D are also linear. So the culprit here that gives us a quadratic size for the factorization is f, right? Because you have a values, for each a value you have some e values, and for each e value you have f values. But the same f may appear over and over again under different contexts of e and uh, a, okay? And that gives us the, the, the quadratic blow up, okay? So in other words, I explained this, right? So in other words, um, our factorization size is quadratic. But recall that the fractional edge cover number was three. So this means that the listing representation was cubic. So factorization already gives us something, but we can do better, yeah? And, uh, and that's the message with this uh, fractional hypertrib width. Yeah? The observation is that we said, hey, everything else is linear except for f. But f, f does not depend on a given a value for e. So what if we do the following? Take for a given e value all its f values and put them in a union. For another e value, we take its f, we put them in a union, and we have this Essentially, we chunk the relation u into such union of f values for each e, right? And then, when we actually stitch together in our factorization, under a particular a, if we have an e, under a different a, if we have another, the same e, we basically point to the same union of f values for that e. We don't repeat the union of f values for the same e under different a values, right? And that is told that is, is basically uh, uh, apparent to us because we know that given an e value, a and f are independent of each other, right? So the key information we have is what makes the difference. Previously, if we didn't use this uh, caching or sharing, right, we lost the information about the keys. We said, oh, they don't care. They don't, they don't, they don't matter here, but they do matter. They make the gap, right? And the gap I just discussed can be as large as logarithmic in the number of, uh, of, uh, of relations in the query, in the exponent. In this case, what happens is that now we have as many f values, as, at most as many as values, f values as we have in the input database, and it's the same for the other uh, 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 variables. So we have effectively linear, uh, linear size factorization instead of having a quadratic size factorization. So again, the message here is that if you go, if you have caching or sharing, right, you get a factorization of linear size. If you have, if you, if you don't have caching, right, then you get quadratic. And if you just want listing representation, you are cubic. This per se doesn't mean much, except for, you know, in case you want to store data or you want to ship data across uh, 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 the, the, the network which actually makes sense uh, in case of distributed systems, where people care a lot about communication cost. But in a, in a centralized setting, it also makes a lot of sense if, you, if this representation can support easily subsequent processing, like counting or summing. If you can do sum in this compressed domain without having to unfold everything into a listing representation, you are a winner. And that's what happens, actually. And this is something we will see next uh, uh, session. Right, so I still have some time, right? Yeah, you tell me, you know, a bit, uh, how many minutes? Like, uh, five minutes? Five minutes, okay. So enough for me to actually wrap up this part and to say that uh, um, uh, there are alternative characterizations of this fractional hypertree width, so the, 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 the most refined no notion we've seen so far which is, by the way, if you try to connect it to other notions of widths that are known in the literature, like tree width, this can be arbitrarily smaller as well, right? Okay, so it can be much, much better, right? So, but this takes us, us uh, you know, advantage of the fact that the input data is considered sparse. So in the input data, in the relation, you don't have everything, you know, if you have two columns A and B, you don't have all possible values of A pair with all possible values of B, or, so, or almost all, right? Okay, otherwise it wouldn't, uh, uh, you wouldn't really, it wouldn't, it wouldn't bring you much. So this uh, uh, characterization is uh, due to uh, Marx in 2010, 
And the idea is this. If you give a joint query Q, and let's say we have a set T of all possible hyper decompositions of the hypergraph of Q. There may be exponentially many of them. But you know, uh, this is exponential in, in, in essentially the number of relations in the query or the number of variables in the query. So a parameter which is considered to be small is not the same as the number of tuples in the input database. So it's fine to just think of enumerating over them. Yeah? Okay? So the way you define this width is as follows, right? You, you take each hyper decomposition, you minimize over all possible hyper decompositions, and for each hyper decomposition, you look at its, uh, uh, at its bags, and you compute the fraction each cover number for each bag. That is, if you look at each bag, each bag has some variables in there. You, these variables are covered by some relations. You take those relations that cover uh, the variables in the bag, and you take the raw star of that, of that subquery. Okay? You take it for another bag. For all the bags, you do the same. And then you take the maximum over all these uh, numbers. And that maximum would give you the fractional uh, hypertree width of that particular decomposition. But that may not be the best, so this is why you have to go over all possible hyper decompositions to try to find the minimum. Yeah? And that minimum is basically also the way you'd like to evaluate your query, with that hyper decomposition that witnesses the minimum fractional hyper tree width. Okay? Yeah? So it makes sense, right? Um, now, this is hard to compute, yeah? But hard in the query size. It's not hard in the data size, yeah? But there are approximations. So there are people who can actually develop, to, like Georg Gottlob, for instance, right, uh, at Oxford, but also Daniel Marx, I think, and also Hung looked at this problem, Hung Ngo. They actually looked at um, uh, approximations that would say something like this. I can give you a width which is within a certain constant from the, from the minimal width, but I can do that in polynomial time. So there are results of this sort. But to me, actually, you know, as a, you know, with my practitioner hat, I want better the, the minimal width than actually having a, a because you see, uh, you know, after that we look at the data, and this width is in the exponent, size of the data to that exponent. Size of the data to an exponent versus size of the data to three times that exponent makes a big difference, yeah? Okay, but you know, for, for a theoretic, from a theoretical point of view, it's also, also interesting to investigate that. But the alternative characterization uh, of this uh, width would be via variable orders, obviously, the, the equivalent uh, uh, mechanism uh, to capture conditional independence we've seen uh, so far. And the idea is this, let's actually now for our query, joint query Q, define the set of all variable orders for that joint query. Then what we do is similar. We look at all possible variable orders, and we minimize over them, and for each variable order, we essentially look at all queries defined by the key of every variable. The key, right, of a variable and the variable itself. We we'll de define a subquery, and we take the fractional edge cover number of that subquery. And then we take the maximum over all the, all such uh, 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 subqueries, right? We look at every, every variable in our, uh, it's actually enough to look at, uh, at, the, at the leaves, right, of the variable orders. And after that, you can actually uh, 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 get uh, the width for that variable order. You minimize overall possible widths, and then you get the overall width for your query. And that's it. That's the way you can actually achieve this. Uh, and uh, just one thing, you know, in practice, if you compare factorization with things like uh, zip compression, you know, zip actually is good, but zip has a sliding window that goes over the data, and if it so happened that you have a large block of data go, uh, that repeats itself but you know, farther away, zip is not able to capture that sort of sharing, that, that sort of you know, factorization. And because of that, what you actually can see here is that this is the compression ratio of, of factorization, the red line, you know, so this is log scale. Uh, as you increase the database uh, uh, scale, also log scale, right? Uh, and, and the other green and blue lines are actually in case we use some, some form of uh, 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 gzip, uh, right? Which here I use compression level six, which is actually way, I mean, you know, takes a lot of time because it has a larger sliding window. And uh, just to say, in reality, you know, we use retailer data sets, for instance, for clients, and we realize that if we have, you know, this sort of star schema with inventory 84 million tables, 
uh, uh, tuples and uh, in five tables in total, or here one, two, three, four, five, even six we use here, we can get compression factors of like you know, 26 times or 160 times. Uh, for last FM, which is a public data set with user artists, friends, and uh, tagged artists, we can get even you know, 1,000 times compression factors. Uh, you know, if you play with certain queries that actually factorize very well, you can get to more than 86 million times. You cannot obviously, you know, you can compute the count of the result, but you cannot actually list the, the tuples in the result. Uh, the Twitter data set is actually, if you want to do triangles on it, triangles do not factorize well, but nevertheless, you can get a factor of, you know, two, three, or if you do queries which actually factorize well, like the bow type query we'll see later, you can get to 5,000. And the Yelp data set, which is in the Kaggle competition for machine learning, if you do this sort of stuff, you get about 40, 185 uh, times uh, compression. And uh, this is what we see also when learning uh, uh, regression models over, over the Yelp data set, actually. So let me stop here. And in the, we still have a, an hour in which I would like to say a few things about worst case optimal join algorithms. And then if there are further questions, then I will, take some, I will do some quizzes. Should we continue? <clears throat> Yes? Can you actually look at the two scenarios? I would like to understand better uh, maybe something. So like you said that like you use this tech also to compare, for example, the Twitter data set, yes, just follow for the yeah. So like then you would kind of like factorize the parts of the So so yeah, so this so this is a very good question. Because in the case of Twitter data set, if you want to do a a, a, a triangle, right? You, a triangle query, we know that asymptotically you cannot get anything. There, right? I mean, you know, we just discussed about that, right? Um, what happens is that in practice, however, you may actually still get a bit because, you know, our results make no assumption about the data, right? The, the worst case optimal results, right? Or tie size bounds with respect to the worst case uh, scenario, right? But in practice, you may not meet that particular worst case scenario. It may be that in the, tra in the, in the Twitter data set, there are, there are some repeating, I don't know, you know, you have follower follower information, right? So let's say the first column has A, the second is B, you know, and A has a value like, you know, the ID of a particular uh, user, you know, millions of times. Well, instead of, you know, if you, if you do a factorized representation, that million of appearances of the same ID is represented only once, right? Because, you know, you say a union over all the distinct user IDs and then you go below and below and so on. So essentially, you gain a bit, not asymptotically, but practically you gain a bit out of it. Yeah? You see, you see what I'm saying, right? The data may not be fitting exactly the worst case scenario you have there. So this is why you get a little bit of, uh, yeah? I mean, you know, just think of, even if you take a relation, a simple relation, and you represent it as a try, that is as a, you know, a tree, Right? You still get, gain some, some benefits potentially, right? If a value is heavy, appears very many times, and if you represent it only once in this try, right, there is in fact some benefit of it, yeah? Of doing it that way, yeah? So do you have this as a benchmark? Do you have like how much you will get just by simply creating? Yeah, well, we have, I, I, I don't have here uh, uh, on the slides, but this is something we do at the moment. So what we want to do at the moment is actually a problem called uh, inverse query problem. That is, uh, you are given the output of the query somehow. You are given a relation, and you assume that this is the output of the, of the query. And you want to go back and find the input and the query which would produce that output, right? And, um, and, and, and you know, uh, as part of that uh, effort, we also looked at uh, what if we just compress uh, uh, one of these relations, for instance, uh, the ones we have uh, from our, uh, uh, you know, uh, from some of the uh, uh, you know, a uh, retail uh, domain, like uh, uh, an advertisement scenarios, like the, the, the retailer data set here. And if you just look at the inventory relation, the 84 million tuples there, we realize the following, that this is in fact a three-dimensional tensor. So it is uh, effectively mapping uh, a triple of uh, location, date, and product identifier to, let's say, sales, or to, to the number of units sold. Right? Or, you know, inventory units or something like that, right? But this tensor is very sparse because, for instance, in, uh, you know, to make up these 84 million tuples uh, entries, uh, you will use something like 124 dates, 3,000 products, 3,000 locations, 
and um, and what was it? Uh, uh, and and uh, and products also about three thousand, right? So obviously, there is in fact uh, there are a lot of combinations missing there, right? And there is also there are a lot of them that uh, that, that 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 are similar in a sense, right? So the same location may actually see the same uh, uh, the same date or for 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 a set, a set of dates. Uh, 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 the same uh, product sold uh, uh, the, the same num uh, number of times, right? Or across locations, you may get the same, the same issue, right? So all I'm saying is that the data, even, even without this structure, because you see wh what we discussed so far is, what would be the structure of the join result? And we realize that we can programmatically uh, avoid redundancy there by understanding the structure of the query leading to that data, Right? But there is even more to it, namely that even if you take a relation without any knowledge of how it was produced, you may be able to compress it. Right? But that's not something uh, I wanted, I, I've been meaning to, but, but it, is a, it is an excellent question. I've not been meaning to get into this because I have no you know, simple uh, results that, that could be you know, amenable to, to, to actually such a, such a course here. Okay? Are, are there other questions? Good. So let me actually then uh, um, um, go into the following topic, worst case optimal join algorithms, right? So far, we looked at size bounds for join results, right? And I very much hope that by now you have a, an understanding of the structural decomposition approaches, the two of them, hyperty decomposition, um, variable orders, right? We can effectively use them to do analysis and understand measures of, of result sizes. And these measures are, uh, um, you know, fractional edge cover number, okay? Uh, another one is this factorization width, and yet another, uh, another one is uh, uh, fractional uh, 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 hypertree width, okay? Now the question is this. Uh, can we actually design algorithms that can attain these complexities as well? Can we produce the result within the same time as, as these sizes, uh, you know, I mean proportional to the sizes, right? So that is actually a very interesting question. So historically, people came up first with the size bounds, and later on, they were able to come up with algorithms matching these size bounds. With a with notable exception, in case of the listing representation, there has been an algorithm called the leapfrog trijoin algorithm, and I will explain you the, this algorithm. You'll see it's, in hindsight, is a rather uh, you know, natural, simple algorithm. Um, and this has been implemented in a commercial system. And after the first paper was published on worst case optimal join algorithms, uh, the author of that system, right, called Todd Huizen, looked back at his algorithm and realized that his algorithm is also worst case optimal. Right, so this is one of the rare cases where people did something and then they realized actually, you know, uh, well, I mean, th this guy was originally a professor in, in Canada, but then decided to, to, to actually switch to, to industry. And uh, 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 so he had all the, all the necessary knowledge to, to basically, you know, prove some, something like this. But, you know, inspired by theoretical research, he actually went back and realized that his algorithm is also worst case optimal. And he published a paper on that later. And that paper got a best paper award, actually, at, uh, at ICDT, at the Database Theory Conference in 2014. But without uh, further ado, let me actually show you a very simple algorithm, right, that actually can, can achieve this. Can, in fact, compute worst case optimally um, a factorized representation of the joint result. And as a particular case, also the uh, a listing representation. Okay? Um, I would like to emphasize again, because uh, there are questions and I also got uh, some observations over the break. So the setting is worst case here, right? What does it mean? It means that we look at worst case behavior. We don't try to understand instance optimality, which would mean that for this particular data set, this is, we, the, 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 this is what, what we can do and this is the best. You cannot come up with a better algorithm for this, right? No, worst case means you make no assumption about the data. You know, all you know is that the data has these, uh, you know, tables uh, with these uh, attributes, these columns, right, and these sizes, and that's about it, okay? And you try to account for anything that, that may come in that data, right, for worst case behavior, okay? And this is a pretty common notion, I would say, in, 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 in computer science, right? Also because we are unable to do better. 
There are only very, very few algorithms that are actually known to be instance optimal. And one of them uh, we just, uh, I just mentioned, but I want to actually, you know, in, in, in this discussion to bring up the, the, the subject, is actually an algorithm for computing top K uh, over N lists. Uh, uh, you know, imagine you have N lists, and uh, you have a function that can combine uh, uh, an element from each list. You know, it can put together these elements, and this function is monotone and can produce a score. And you want the top K uh, combinations with respect to that score, right? So you want the top K that is, you know, with the, with the, with the highest score or with the, with the lowest score, let's say, right? And this is called the threshold algorithm. And the guy, uh, uh, so one of the guys who actually co-authored the paper on this, which is, uh, uh, well, his name is actually uh, Ron Fagin, a guy from IBM Research, Almaden, got the Gödel Prize, actually, amongst other things also for this, uh, you know, uh, achievement, right? So these are very rare, right? More often, we get actually to worst case optimality, okay? But this is also something interesting, I would say. Um, right, so this slide shows that we can actually map exactly what we've seen uh, uh, with sizes now also for uh, uh, times. In particular, given a join query and uh, uh, for any database of size n, the join result can be computed in this time. So it's either, you know, in case of listing representation, n to this fractional edge cover number of the query. And this was a result uh, uh, actually in 2012, the best paper uh, uh, award at uh, uh, the database systems uh, conference in uh, pods called in 2012. But also the, the, the Belhoisen paper I just mentioned with leapfrog tri join algorithm. And there is also another one uh, now uh, that looks at factorization without caching. And this one actually gets n to this s, the factorization width parameter, or the n to fractional hypertree width parameter, in case we use caching, okay? So these upper bounds essentially follow the succinctness gap, right? But there are, uh, there are worst case optimal modulo logarithmic factor in the sense that these algorithms essentially need to sort the data first. So they need an n log n time to start with, okay? But the, the, the results are never stated like this. You know, sometimes with a tilde over the O to say that this is a soft O is uh, modulo logarithmic factors. Um, and this is with respect to data complexity. What does it mean, data complexity? Data complexity means that um, we don't care about, uh, in, in the formula representing the complexity, we don't care about uh, parameters pertaining to the query, like uh, number of relations, like number of variables, for instance, right? We only care about data size, and this is n, yeah? Because it is widely assumed, and this is why the, this notion was born something like, you know, in 77, so go, you know, 41 years ago by Chandra and Merlin, they actually said, look, queries are small, databases are large, so in this setting it makes sense to talk about data complexity, not combined complexity, which would be a function of both the query sizes, like you know, number of relations on, as I said, and data sizes. Yeah? In other settings, this is blurred. You, know? you, may, you may not be able to distinguish so well between query small and data large, but here we do this distinction. Yeah? Uh, if you want combined complexity, then uh, you would have an additional quadratic factor in the number of variables, and a linear factor in the number of relations, okay, in your query queue. And, and that would be then the, the, the full uh, menu. Okay, so I will show you how to compute the factorized join result with an example, and then I will draw uh, to a conclusion, you know, what, what would be the algorithm to do this, right? So imagine for our example that uh, we have this join that of orders, dishes, and items, and uh, I will get this particular uh, variable order. I will use it, right? I could use a different one as input. I don't need to use this. Think of it as a sort of query plan, which you can optimize before, and this is the input. You use it then to compute your result. This variable order will give us, obviously, a measure of width, like the fractional hypertree width, which should ideally govern what is the number of operations, the computation steps, steps we took in order to compute the, the, the factorized result. The execution plan then mirrors exactly this variable order. What we do is exactly this. 
Here we have dish at the very, uh, at the very top. So let us look at which relations contain dish. So we have orders and dishes. And here what I say is that instead of dish, I actually say explicitly which operation I want to do. And the operation is I want to intersect orders and dish on the dish column. So I want the dishes. And I want a union over all these dishes. Now, given a dish, I branch out, because I have a, a Cartesian product, because I branch out here in the variable order. On one side, I want to basically look inside the orders for a given dish to look up and get the days. And I want a union of these days. And now, given the dish and the day, I want to get the customers for that dish and day from the same relation O. On the other branch, given a dish, I do the lookup and get all the items for that dish. And given the item, I do a lookup and get all the prices for that item. In this case, there is a single price. Okay? So that's the plan. Now, it is clear that you know, if you get a different variable order, you can then map it to a different execution plan. Right? And what is important here? There are a couple of very important issues we have to do well. One is, as you can see, every time a variable appears in different relations, we need to do an intersection right, on that. And to do intersection efficiently, this means that this relation should be sorted, ideally, on that column. So you know, if they are sorted, we can do the intersection much faster. And um, we need also a very fast algorithm to do, to do intersection. Ideally, we like the intersection to take no longer than the minimum sizes, the minimum size of the two lists. So if we have two lists and we want to intersect, one is small, one is large, we want to take time proportional to the size of the small one. Okay? This is a very important uh, prerequisite. There is another important prerequisite, which is the following. What if dish, or let's say another variable, appears in many relations? We should not intersect you know, two at a time. Because it so happened that perhaps we, we are unlucky and we intersect two lists which are very large. We get a large result, intermediate result, and only later intersect with something that doesn't intersect at all with our intermediate result. And then we actually pay the price for nothing. So we should intersect all the lists at the same time. This in databases is called multi-way join. Instead of binary join, is a multi-way join. Right? These are the very important prerequisites of this algorithm to work well. If you have these prerequisites, and which are easy to attain, because you know, doing multi-way joints instead of binary joints is in our power, right? using a list, uh, efficient list intersection is something we can look up in the literature. And there are many algorithms that can do this efficiently. They do this efficiently you know, in RAM model of computation. They can do it on SIMD. They can do it on GPUs. They can do it on many, many things. Right? And there is actually a flurry of papers in SIGMOD, which is the database systems conference, uh, uh, you know, the kind of top one, where people actually see lots of papers, flurry of papers just talking about this. Oh, how can we do list intersection you know, on SIMD? How can we do it in the NUMA architecture? How can we do it on GPUs? How can we do this and so on and so forth? Okay? Why? Because it turns out that even in our context, it's so important right? to obtain it, uh, to do it efficiently. Right? Okay? Yeah? OK, so is this clear? So all, all these prerequisites. So now, let's actually see how we can compute. So we look at the very top. This is what we have to evaluate. How can we compute this? This union of this intersection essentially means list for me the items, the, the dishes in this case, right, in the intersection of the dishes from orders and dishes from dish. So two lists. I just compute them. And I want to compute them also in an order. Right? Because they are given in an order, the output is also easy to obtain in that order, right? Because it can help me for other reasons. But imagine for the time being that you know we have this data sorted initially, and we can produce that. Yeah? Okay? Now we go down. Well, let's say we go to the left and look at burger. Under burger, we have this lookup query. Let's look up. We find the days, right, for that particular burger. The the day, the, uh, the, the these days are the, the days. Uh, this burger was, uh, well, the, this particular dish was, was ordered. Underneath, we look at the customers ordering on that day that dish. And this is Alice. Then here we have Alice as well. This is, uh, yeah, so this would be the, the items of the burger. Okay? And we go like this. And, and, and there is one, one important aspect I want, I want to draw attention here. Namely that when we actually expanded 
the items of a burger and we go back to the prices, what we realize is that we know from the variable order that the, 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 the price is independent of the dish given the item. So what we can do, we can actually have a hash map which caches for us, or is, is memoization effectively, right? We cache this information because it may be that the same item may occur again later under a different uh, dish. So we just cache it. So we have a cache for every single type. Here we have a cache for uh, the items, right? Okay, so we go further. We cache that one as well. We cache that, that one as well. We, get that, we, we now go to the other side, to the hot dog. We descend, okay? So now we look at the items for hot dog. We get those. But now when we look to get the price for the bun, we first ask, we realize that it might have been cached. Why? Because there is this conditional independence we have between price and, and dish and things above uh, uh, price, right? Given an item. So we just look up first in the cache to see, is there anything there for us? And yes, there is, so then we just uh, reuse it in a way, right? You use that computation or we point to that uh, particular uh, 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 item, right? To that particular price or that particular subtree of our factorization or directly cyclic graph in general, right? For onion the same, sausage, we look up, but there is nothing for us to gain, right? And then we do the same here and, and we are done, right? So that's the algorithm, eff effectively. That's the algorithm. This algorithm, essentially, at each node does the minimal amount of operations in worst case, because you, know, it has, you have to traverse, if you have n list and you have to intersect them, you have to traverse at least the, the, smaller, the smallest list, right? You cannot you know, do it otherwise, exactly, yeah? And then these lookups, if you assume that the data, the, 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 the relations are sorted in the order, in a topological order of your variable order, that is, you know, you start with the, with the, the root and then you go to the branches, right, in some order, then you'll find, for instance, in this case, hold on, I will go back, sorry for that, it will take a bit off because I have all this animation. Um, yeah, here, right, if you look at this, right, then you sort the relation uh, orders by dish day customer in this topological uh, uh, order, right, and then you sort dish item, you use dish item uh, sorting order for dishes and item price for item. So if you do that, when you actually uh, uh, are, are here, for a particular, so for a, for a particular burger, you go here and you want to get all the days for that burger, these days will come in a block, one after the other, because the data is sorted like that, right? So it will, it's very easy to get to the next day, right, for that burger. So these operations actually are, are the, 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 uh, the best we can, we can hope for in this sequential setting, obviously, right? You can do it distributed, that, that would be a different story. Okay? And that's the algorithm. You have the variable order, you do this traversal, this list intersections, provided first you sort the data accordingly. So, so the, 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 the statement I made so far is that uh, 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 this algorithm needs, in worst case, uh, as much time as needed to produce every single value in this uh, representation, given that we know the size of the representation, right, which is, uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, n to fractional hypertree width, then the time taken by the algorithm will be also n to fractional hypertree width, modulo this logarithmic factor which is needed originally in n log n, right, to do sorting. So where does the fractional hyper width uh, appear? I mean, is it, so is it the obvious that you use this running time or what time to the fractional hyper width from the algorithm? Yeah, I mean, uh, what, what, so what we discussed before is this, right? Given the variable order, you can compute a width measure for that variable order, which is the width that tells you what is the size of the factorized representation, right, over that variable order. So if you have a variable order, you construct 
a factorized representation of your joint result, which effectively follows that variable order. And we just discussed before what would be the size of that. And now the argument is that this algorithm, using these very basic constructs, like you know, first sorting in this order given by the variable order, and then uh, doing efficient list intersection, right? Essentially needs as much time, right? as needed to produce the values in this factorized representation. Modulo logarithmic factor, which is necessary at the beginning for sorting. So that's the, 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 the algorithm. So the statement is that the running time of this algorithm is n to the power of fractional hypertree width of the query. Yeah, so this is the, the statement I made before. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So fractional hypertree width of the query in the definition there was, ah, so we used the definition which, uh, could you recall the definition? Maybe this, uh... Yes, which was uh, exactly a few slides before. It was here. Oh, so you used yeah. The yeah, yeah. Any, any of the two definitions. In my case, I used the one with variable order simply because the variable orders are the ones I use for factorization, but equivalently, you can use the, 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 the hyperty decomposition one. So effectively, what, what, what we say here is that we have a, a stage where we do optimization and a stage where we do execution. For the stage where we do optimization, we compute a variable order which has a good width. But, but any, any, any width, you can, you can take any variable order. For any variable order, you'll get a width. And then the size is governed by that width and the time to compute the factorization over that variable order is also governed by the same width. So the width here is the row star of this uh, of, uh, of the keys plus the variable. Yeah. So you, you make some assumption, I guess, that you can compute uh, um, a, a, conjunctive, a conjunctive query in this time into the row star. Mm -hmm. that, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it, like, you're, you're using the, 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 the fact which was presented earlier that given a conjunctive query, yeah. you can compute the result in the list representation in time n to the power of rho star. Mm -hmm. Yes, is that right? Yes. I, I will show you actually uh, also the, 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 the listing case where, where, where it will become perhaps even more obvious uh, how, how the, the leapfrog trigon algorithm works, which, which, which doesn't make any sort of assumptions. Of this. So could you uh, show exactly where do you use this assumption later when you do the computation in the algorithm? Where, where is it? Where do you use this running time n to the rho star in the, when you presented the algorithm? Right. So, okay. So I so 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 I will go over this. I will show the the, the leapfrog trigon, and I, I I will mention there the dish. Okay. So, okay. So this is actually uh, uh, I I already went over this. Yeah. So let me actually now. Um, okay. So this is something I already mentioned, right? That that you need essentially an intersection to be done very efficiently. And, uh, um, and the, the remaining operations are just lookups. So how to, okay, so, so, so let me first explain this algorithm, which is actually the one where we want listing representation at the end, or we, want, we don't want any sort of uh, you know, uh, uh, compression. Uh, and, and there it should be uh, uh, clear. So uh, this is the leapfrog tri join algorithm, is the, is the much acclaimed worst case optimal join algorithms used by, used by a logic block system. And uh, it essentially computes a listing representation of the join result. It's exactly the instantiation of what I showed you before, right? Except that we use certain variable orders. We don't want branching and we don't want caching. And that's the, 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 the major difference because, you know, we don't want compression in any way, ideally, right? And um, uh, uh, you can see this if you, if you are familiar with the, uh, we sort merge algorithm, you know the sort merge algorithm? The sort merge algorithm essentially, you know, takes two relations, you sort the relations on the, on the join column, and then you do in lockstep, you follow, is this value greater than the other value? If yes, this means you have to advance here until you find a value which is either equal or greater than this value. And then you advance like this in lockstep until you find the values, you report them, and then you go further, right? Now, you want, as I mentioned before, you don't want to do this only binary, but multi-way, because you want to be able to do this uh, intersection, right, uh, efficiently, right, because, you know, because of the issue with intermediate representation. Um, 
so in this sense, it's a multi-way sort merge algorithm that has efficient uh, list intersection. So that is what, what this algorithm is about. It's a special case of what I presented before, uh, where essentially our variable order is just a path, so there is no branching. And for each variable, essentially the keys are just all variables that sit on top. So there is no independence captured by using the keys. So there is no caching. Okay? So in particular, for our query, if we take now a variable order, which is this path, we construct an execution plan, which is exactly like this. So we say here, go over day. Okay? Now, for customer, uh, uh, you, for a given day, you, you iterate over the customers. And then for a given day and customer, you iterate over the dish, and so on and so forth, right? So you go like this, right? Step by step. So if you achieve this, then essentially what, what, uh, what, what it means here is that uh, you expand at each step, right? So here you have, for instance, uh, uh, you want all the days from the order because you want to order by by day first. So it's easy to get all the days. For each day, you then go, you descend, and then you compute uh, the customers for that day, you know, and so on and so forth. And this is the way you basically compute all the, the, the full join result. I show it here as a try, but in fact, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can imagine, you can just enumerate them. You don't have to compress them at the very top. You just, you know, every, every branch represents a tuple in the, in the result. And you can output it like that. You don't have to store it. You just output, you know, a branch at a time. I mean, a path, a root to leaf path at a time. And that will represent a tuple. And then you move to the next tuple and so on and so forth. So that's, so that's the thing. So <clears throat> the optimality uh, uh, to go back to your question comes in the fact that uh, um, uh, um, you, we effectively... First of all, do this multi-way, right, which is the essential part. And second of it is um, we, we intertwine the, 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 the let's say, the, the search for values for a particular variable with the search for values for other variables. So I can actually try to give an example with the, with the, with the triangle query, okay? So in case of the triangle query, we have A, B, and C as the variable order. Right? Let's say, right? The triangle query, I will remind you, is A, B, R2 is uh, A, C, and R3 is B, C. Okay? Yeah? Okay, can you actually see this, guys? Good. So, <clears throat> um, so what do you do at A? At A, what you really want to do is an intersection of A with the A in R2. So you want to go over this. Yeah? So once you got a value for A here, you then want, so let's say here you have, uh, 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 so this is something like A1 to AN, all these values, right? So what you want to do is, you go, you get the first value A1, and under A1, you do an intersection on the Bs for a given A1 with the with Bs here. Okay, so here C we don't, we don't care yet about, yeah? We do an intersection. So, so far, it's like we do essentially, uh, you know, here a, a binary join you thing. But no, once you get this A1, you descend, and here let's say you get the B1 to Bm. You then get the B1, and in the context of this A1, B1, you then now uh, check the intersection on C. So because here at C, we do intersection. So what we do here is R3, we have, uh, well, we have uh, 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 R2, which has uh, A1 and C, is now intersected with R3, which has B1 and also C. So we don't construct all possible combinations of A's and B's before we look at the C's, but rather we, we intertwine this. 
And this is the way uh, Velhoisen showed that his algorithm is, in fact, uh, optimal, right? That, that actually it has to look at, uh, <clears throat> it doesn't compute all combinations of A's and B's before it, look, it is looking at C. And if an A1 is not actually, you know, working here, right? This will be empty, okay? And it will then recurse, will go basically to the next B, and it will check again, and so on and so forth. So in worst case, this is actually the, the, the best you can do. Right? <clears throat> so in a sense, this size I mentioned before is the measure of, of you know, the, 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 size, the, the size measure, the, 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 the rho star, the fractional hyper uh, edge cover number, is a measure that, while necessary for the analysis, I would say, uh, in their case, is not really necessary to get an algorithm that, that is worst case optimal. So in the paper, what Velhoisen showed is that, in fact, the analysis of his algorithm, right, yields the same measure as this fractional edge cover number. Or the quantity computed, he has to compute, must necessarily match that fractional edge cover number. Right? So in a sense, okay, how to put it differently? These weeds are actually necessary to for us to reason about sizes, and it's a, it's a convenient uh, 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 tool, analytical tool, but in order to obtain uh, 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 the, 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 the optimality for the algorithm, the time optimality, you don't really need to use anything about fractional edge cover number, right? The, the, the theory developed around fractional edge cover number, in fact, right? You can just do it directly here. Right? You just, you know, but here, as you can see, you do it variable at a time. If you try to do it relation at a time, as it is done in query plans, you'll ultimately fail. Because you may create, as I said, results which may, uh, intermediate results which may be larger than the, than the final result. Okay, so I'm not sure whether I answered your question, uh, you know, uh, uh, well, well enough. Uh, so I, I guess it's, it's not immediately clear that this is worst case optimal. You, you need to, uh, I mean, one would need to show this, right? Yeah, so, uh, so one would need to show this. How do you show this? You show that uh, uh, if, you, if you design, a, 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 you know, a, a class of databases, for which it is necessary to do all the, all the steps, all, the, all these traversal steps you, you actually, and the algorithm does anyway, in, in order to produce the result. And that's it. And for that, you don't need the fractional edge cover number to show that. Yeah? <clears throat> so that's the, the, the Velhoisen paper. <clears throat> the other paper, which, you, so there is a paper which, I, which I, I reference here, if you want to look up, and I recommend this, is the Sigmund record paper from 2013, of uh, Hung Ngo and Christopher Ray and, uh, and others, uh, they introduce another algorithm, so-called generic algorithm, which is uh, essentially uh, 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 an easier, ver a simpler version even of this algorithm, right? It has a few, a few, a few lines of, uh, of, of code and that's it, yeah? This is called the, uh, the generic algorithm. And, and the reasoning there is similar, right? Okay, good. So that's, uh, so that's the, the, the thing. So I hope, I hope you got the algorithm, right? What exactly, how the algorithm actually works. Is that, is that clear, guys? Yeah? Yeah, good. I'm glad. Good, so I, I, would, I would just like, like to say a few things about, you know, I mean, we looked at, uh, you know, I mean, so, so this is a more, more, more on the practical side to motivate it a bit. First, we, we look at uh, the things here uh, 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 below. Uh, essentially, uh, we, have, uh, we, we have a data set, uh, housing data set that uh, actually uh, has several tables. Uh, uh, one table uh, lists uh, houses to be, uh, to be sold in a particular zip code. And there are very many houses per zip code. And, um, and, uh, and, uh, and this particular scale factor here uh, essentially says uh, how many uh, houses you can have per uh, um, uh, 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 per uh, zip code, and there are about 25,000 zip codes. And you can have another table where we say, you know, per zip code, we have this amount of restaurants, this amount of uh, 
uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, schools uh, or institutions and so on and so forth, which makes the, the, the house, let's say, you know, more uh, desirable because you think, you know, I would like to buy a house that has, you know, is near a school and, it's, uh, you know, uh, I, perhaps is near the, the university if I work at the university and so on and so forth. Yeah? So all I'm saying here is this, that, that if we do the join of these tables, for each zip code you have to combine a lot of houses with a lot of institutions, with a lot of restaurants, and so on and so forth. And ultimately, uh, if you look at the size of the result, you'll get a function which is more or less cubic in S, right? But if you factorize it, you know, for each zip code, you represent distinctly um, uh, houses from restaurants, from institutions, and so on and so forth, it will stay linear. And this is what we observe with our tool, that uh, uh, if you look here, this is the actual uh, uh, size, the size is in red, as we increase the scale factor, the size stays uh, very small, and the time, which is in green, stays also very small. Yeah? Whereas if you actually do it with a system like Postgres or any other system, then the increase is, uh, is, uh, is cubic. Because here we have on both si uh, sides, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, log scale. So here is for the actual uh, uh, join time, and here is for the actual uh, number of values we have in there. So one increases linearly, the other one increases uh, cubically, essentially, right, what happens. And if you look at the compression ratio versus joint speed up, you see that they are actually quite on par, which essentially means that uh, if you compress well, processing the join is also, can also be done very well. And here, we assume that internally we, 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 we factorize the representation, but we still like to enumerate all the tuples in the result, right? We still want to present the user with all the all the tuples, not, not factorized, but, but listed. And, and we also tried other data sets. So here is, for instance, a very small data set where, where the gap in compression is, is large, but in, in time is not as large, simply because the data set is anyway very small and can be done very, very quickly. Uh, uh, in the case of retailer, we realized that uh, uh, the compression is about 21, and the speed up in that old experiment was about seven. Yeah. If, if you don't actually list the, 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 repre the, the tuples in the representation, this speed up would be on par with this 21. In fact, even more, we realized, uh, in, in some cases, simply because we can optimize further. Uh, but that, 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 in case you want to do afterwards count or sum or other aggregates, and not just list tuples in the representation. Good. So this is a bit to give you, uh, you know, to bring it back, uh, to bring back a bit of the, the practical side of it. Um, now, uh, I have the following uh, uh, options. I would like to first mention, well, first I will mention this, but then I, I could go a bit in one of these topics. In particular, I prepared something about adaptive joint processing where we could go even below uh, uh, the, 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 the fractional hypertree we dimensioned, and I would like to give you an example as a sort of taster. Another thing is uh, I could uh, go over some quizzes with you such as, you know, let's take a query and let's see whether we can actually uh, get its widths, whether we can actually construct some uh, hyperty decomposition, some variable orders over them, and, uh, and, uh, and how the, an algorithm would look like that, that would compute uh, uh, that, that join. What do you think? Which one would you prefer in the remaining time? The second part. Okay, good. So this is anyway, the, the, the rest is here on the slide, so you can anyway have, have a look at it, right? So let me uh, uh, jump over this. <clears throat> uh, okay, 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 the quiz. Um, yeah, we can start with, with a simple query, right? So this is a path query. I, I will just use this board, if that's okay. So this is a path query in the sense that, you know, you jump x1, x2, x2, x3, 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 x3 x4, and so on and so forth, okay? So let's actually see, um, uh, so what are we asked for? Well, first of all, let, let's, let's do the, the hypergraph of it, right? The hypergraph, so we have x1, x2, x3, x4, and, well, let's say x2, x3, xn plus 1, xn. So, we have this, we have that, we have something here, we have something here, we have something here, right? So that is the actual hypergraph. Do you agree? Yeah, we have binary edges, sort of binary, okay? 
So, yes? And was one and answering of the daughter. Yes, exactly. I wanted, in fact, to say n minus 1, but then I realized that uh, on the slide we have n plus 1. So it's like Sn, Xn, Xn plus 1. Good. So um, what would be a good hyperty decomposition of it? Well, I mean, this here, you know, remember what, what, what is a hyperty decomposition. Hyperty decomposition essentially says this, that uh, uh, you construct a, a tree. The nodes are, in fact, bags, which are sets of the variables, such that two properties hold. One property says the following, which is the coverage property, says that every hyper H here, every set of variables, right, is included in one of the bags, in at least one of the bags. And the second is the connectivity property, which says that uh, uh, if you have in this tree, in, you know, in several bags x1, then all the bags in between must have x1 as well. So effectively, this means this. This is a particular This is a particular uh, hyperty decomposition, right? It is a tree. It is a path, in fact, right? Um, we, can, we can make other ones. Do you agree? We can, for instance, make one which has uh, x1, x2, x3, x4, and x1, xn, xn plus 1, something like that, right? And here has x5, x6, let's say. Do you agree? This is also one, a valid one. Why? It is connected. And these uh, edges are included you know, in some of the, of, the, of the bags, right? OK? But let us now try to compute a width for this, right? But in so this one, we would be like x4 and x5, right, in the hmm? one bag. In the, uh, in the tree on the right, we meet, we meet a bag of x4 and x5. Yeah, we meet with x4, x5. So it must be some. So, so this one, you are right that, 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 that this is the way I wrote it, not yet valid because it doesn't have the coverage property. So I, 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 I would need to have somewhere here x4, x5. But what if I put, uh, let's say, um, uh, here, for instance, x4, x5, and now I want to put here something like uh, x3, x5. Would that be valid? No, because x4, um, x3 is here, x3 is there, but x3 is not in between. Right, so that, that, so that would not be okay, right? Uh, bef before we look at the weeds, let's actually try to get a variable order for this. One, one more question, can yeah. we uh, have uh, like, let's say x4, x5 at the root, and then two, two paths like this, would it be a... Perfect, yes, yes, yes. So you can have this, so it, it doesn't have to be a path. It can be like that, it can be x4, x5. On one side you have x3, x4, x2, x3, or in fact, even better. Why not have x2, x3? No, it doesn't work. x3, x4, x2, x3, x2, x1, right? And on the other side, x5, x6, and so on and so forth. I mean, ultimately, what I did, what, 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 what's, what's, what's the trick here? The trick is you have this path, and you can pick any node and make it the root. It's, it's nothing more than this, right? And that, and that will still be OK. So, so what about possible um, variable orders for this? <clears throat> possible variable orders. So one variable order, for instance, would be just this, you know, x1, x2, x3, x4, blah, blah, blah. Another variable order could be, uh, as, you, as, you, as you noticed, right? In this path, you can pick any node and make it, uh, so it could, could be something like x. Um, if we assume that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, n, n is an odd number, that you make it easier for us, we can pick uh, the middle, right? And you, we branch out so that we have uh, even paths, on even branches, even, uh, even uh, length branches, okay? So, I will, give, I will give a particular example, let's say, for n equals 5. For n equals 5, we have, uh, uh, or even, you know, why not, 6. 
So we have seven in total. Uh, I, I can start with x4. And this is uh, here, for instance, x2. Uh, um, uh, uh, this is, could be x3, x1. Uh, let's, let's, so, so let's put it this way. Yeah, and here could be something like uh, x uh, uh, seven, six, x five, x four. Is this a valid variable order? Is the question. Let's see. Yeah, sorry, x seven. Sorry, sorry. I, I I meant to say x seven. Yeah. What do you think about this? So we have we have two properties we have to satisfy, right? One property says this that. Uh, 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 variables that are in the same relation, right, in the same hyperage, must be along the same path. So x2, x3, x2, x1, x3, x4, x4, x5, x4, no, x6, x7, x6, x5. They are all satisfying the property. Now let us look at the keys for them, right? We have to construct the keys so that they, they actually uh, uh, remain valid. So x3 depends on x2. So it's, I will put it in here, right? X3 does not depend on, uh, oh, it depends also on X4. So I have to put it in here as well. Do you agree? Yeah. So what about this guy, X2? So X2 depends on X4, doesn't depend really on X4. But we have the property that the key of X3 must be included in the key of X2 Union x2. So what is the key of x3? Is this. Right? So in a sense, x2 ma is forced in this key to have x4. Right? This is exactly similar to the connectivity property we had before from, for, the, for the hypergraphs, right? Hyperdecompositions. decompositions, that if you have here x4 and here you have x4, you have to have x4 in between. Right? Okay, so what about on, so I only did it on this side. So x1 here would depend on x2 only, and that's fine. Okay, and the key of it is included in this union, this, right? And similarly, we do it on the other side. Do you agree? So that's one possible variable order. It's unclear whether this is the best variable order, whether you know the one we just discussed where we have just a normal path is, is the best. Let's do the, the, the one path case. The one path case would look like this. x1, x2, x3, x4, x. Well, in this case, we have uh, until 7. OK? So x7, we start from the bottom. x7 depends on x6, right? What about x6? Depends on x5, right? And this one x4, this one x3, this one x2, this one x1, and this one nothing, right? Yes? Cool. So let us now. Consider this hyperdecomposition, decomposition, these two variable orders, and let's compute the widths for them, right? Okay? Is that okay? So, let, let, so let's compute widths. So um, if we take this one and we want to compute the width, we will look at this, yeah, at each node, and we construct a query, which is a query over x over, over x6, x7, essentially. So this is a query that is restricted, is, is like our original query restricted only to the variables x6 and x7. Okay? So what would that query look like? Well, that query could look like just the relation six, uh, 6, right? That actually has x6 and x7. We can do a bit more. We can also include in that subquery. Uh, but asymptotically, it doesn't make any difference, in fact. But we can include the projection of x5 on x6, or of r5 on x6, because r5 also has x6. But we don't need x5 from it. We only need x6. 
So it is as if we take a projection, right, on that. Why? Because it may be that uh, x6 in R5, in relation R5, only has few values. And then we do an intersection of those values, or so the list of these values with the, with the, the ones in, in, in R6, in relation R6, and then we may get, obviously, in practice better. But asymptotically, it doesn't really make a difference, right? So this query, in fact, is just our relation R6. Now, the size of it is n, right? So uh, uh, if, if you want to compute uh, uh, its width, the, the fractional edge cover number, you have a, a, a simple query, which is just a relation. What do you do? You have to cover the, the variables in the relation. You give to the relation the width 1. And that's it. So the, the width here would be 1. OK? OK? You do the same here, 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 here. You, you, you see that is more or less the same, right? Because it's, the, you know, it's just a different index, right? So what does it mean? It means that locally, right, you construct, um, uh, 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 so, so, so locally you have essentially uh, a row star of 1. All of them have a row star of 1. This is the maximum. 1 is the maximum. So the fractional hypertree width of this is 1. OK? So then, so this is the way you get the fractional hypertree width. Yeah? By looking locally at each of these subqueries to get their uh, 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 raw star, their, their fractional edge cover number. I didn't say yet what would be the fractional edge cover number of the whole query. And that is a question. But before we go there, let me actually show you the following. This variable order can be immediately mapped to this uh, hypertree decomposition, right? Because this query is essentially, you know, for instance here, this x1, x2, x1 is mapped to this, right? This one is mapped to this, and so on and so forth, right? So you can immediately get a hypertree decomposition out of this variable order, and vice versa, OK? So the analysis we did here will apply there as well, OK? Because essentially here would be, you know, you take the query over these variables. You take all the edges that go over this variable, and you take uh, the, uh, the row star. But now the question is, what would be the row star of our query? So let me actually draw again the query. And, and oh no, we can, we can generalize it, uh, by, by, but, but, but first let us actually try to take a, a simple example. Like uh, we say uh, um, we have uh, x1, um, right. We have x1, x2, x1, x2, then it is x3, let's say, and this is x4. So, so let's take just the query where n is, uh, is 4. You know, I will write now, uh, I will write down now the, 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 the actual linear program, right, to compute the row star for it. Okay, if we want to come, so essentially we want to, so, to know what is the, the size of the result of this thing, right? So this is relation one, this is relation two, and this is relation three. So my pro program is like this. I minimize xr1 plus xr2 plus xr3, okay, subject to the following. First of all, xri must be greater than or equal to 0, i is 1 to 3. And the second thing is I do the following. I say uh, for relation x1, I have that xr1 must be uh, 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 greater than or equal to 1, because x1 is only covered by r1. For x2, I say that xr1 plus xr2 must be greater than or equal to 1. x3 means that xr2 uh, 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 plus xr3 greater than or equal to 1. And x4 means that xr3 must be greater than or equal to 1. Now, this thing here, obviously, means that we should give a weight of 1 to xr3. This thing here means that we should give a weight of 1 to xr1, right? I mean, if you give more, it doesn't help us. 
it will not really help us minimize, right? So in a sense, I give a weight of one here, I give a weight of one there, I still have one weight to, uh, to assign. The weight of R2, what would be the weight of R2? Zero, right? We don't need it because the guys are covered. So that is one case. So that is the, the case where we have uh, four guys. So now, I will not write anymore the program. I will just actually uh, just extend this with x5. So we have r4. So let us now assign weights. How should we assign weights? The trouble, the tricky thing is you can only start with the end. You can only start with the ends because you realize that x1 being alone forces r1 to get a weight of 1. So this is one here, is one over there. And this already covers some guys. Which guys remain uncovered? X3 remains uncovered. So we have somehow to associate, to, to give some ways to the remaining two relations, edges, right? R2 and R3 in a way that Rx3 is covered. So there are many ways to do that. There are infinitely many ways to do that, right? And still be optimal. One way is to say that X3 uh, xr3 is 1 and the other one is 0, or the other way around, or one is to say half and half, or 3 quarters and 1 quarter, or whatever you like. Right? But bottom line, the message is that you increase the rho star, the, the, the overall cost, right? Becomes 3. Right? So what do you think would be the cost in general if we generalize to n guys? So not only 5 here. Sorry? Very good. So that is the thing, right? This is the raw star. Yeah? But we just show, uh, uh, show that the fractional hypertree width is 1, right? So you see now the gap you can get between, for the case of the path query between the, the two, right? Could be, could be pretty large. If n is something like 100, well, you know, it's hypothetical, you know, then one, one is something like 50, the exponent is 50, the other one, the exponent is 1. Right? Okay? Is this a good exercise? Is it, uh, is it better? Yeah? Good. Uh, so, um, there are more queries here, right? Which I hope you, you may find a pleasure to, uh, uh, to look at, uh, uh, at home, and I would be very happy to talk uh, with you about them uh, after uh, the, uh, the course tomorrow, or if you want also before. You know, I don't know where, if there is a seminar room, I, I could easily, you know, if you are interested, you just uh, email uh, Shimon or email me directly. Right? I think you, it's better to email me directly so that we don't, uh, you know, uh, you know have uh, Shimon uh, have, to, uh, have to go over this. But this is actually a very interesting query. So this is the query I wanted you to do. This lumis whitney query, which is related to this lumis whitney inequality we had at the very beginning, I mentioned to you, right, from 49. So the idea is that uh, this inequality estimates the size of a d-dimensional set by using sizes of d minus 1 dimensions, uh, right? Uh, the dimensional projections of it, right? So, it, so the query is here, right? So you have n variables, x1 to xn, yeah? But then you take n minus 1 subsets of them. There are n such n minus 1 subsets. And you say, you know, x1 to xn minus 1, x2 to xn, and so on and so forth. And the question is, what would be the actual uh, uh, fractional edge cover number of this? It's a very, very cute formula, actually, yeah? Which is almost linear, but not quite, yeah? And by the way, the triangle query is a special case where n is 3. Because if n is 3, we then have three variables, right? And two, any, any, any pair of the, variable, of the three variables would be actually a relation, right? And the question is, what would be the rho star for it? What would be the fractional hyper three width of it? But first of all, what would be a valid uh, uh, three decomposition of it? Clearly, we have to have, uh, let's say, if, if we look at the first relation R1 there, we have uh, x2 to xn in there, right? 
So x2 to xn must be part of a bag. And then let's say that x1 is part of another bag, right? But x1 will also appear with the other variables eventually in some relation, in some com you know, uh, combination. So effectively, this one is, you know, all variables must be in the same bag. And because of that, fractional hypertree width cannot give us anything beyond, what, uh, beyond the, the fractional edge cover number, right? So factorization cannot give us anything asymptotically in this case, yeah? So if you, if you solve it for the rho star, for the fractional edge cover number, you already know the fractional hypertree width of it, okay? The question is, what is the fractional hypertree width? I mean, obviously, you can immediately solve this by going home. You know, you program this in eigen, or you take, you know, uh, if you want to make it more symbolic, you take uh, uh, Z3, right? And then, uh, you know, it will tell you the, the, the solution. But I want, I want you to do it without actually getting help from, a, from an existing uh, uh, solver, okay? Is that okay? How, how are we on time? Are we okay? Good. So I will stop here. I hope you'll also go and look at the other thing I mentioned with the Boolean loop query, because this is actually very exciting. Okay, good, and see you tomorrow.